Good morning. Can I get a confirmation that everyone is caffeinated? Maybe a head nod or a woohoo? Not Woo enough. Woo <laughs> Great. Thank you all for coming here so early to hear our talks. I'm really excited to share some of my research with you. Uh, my name is Riley Havel. I'm an upcoming senior at the University of Central Florida. I study physics and geoscience, but my main research interests are in astrobiology. So part of astrobiology is being able to model the past climates of planets to look for instances of habitability. While I'm not doing this for Mars, I was working on it this summer for Earth. So I did some Greenland modeling uh, during the MIS-11 era. Yeah. Green gospel. Got it. So a little bit of a background. Uh, the MIS-11 interglacial is marked by periodic changes in the oxygen isotope ratios in rock and uh, ice. So you can see in the graph to the right, I've blocked out some of the previous and uh, more recent eras so you can focus on MIS-11. Um, MIS-11 began about 474,000 years ago, so a while. It lasted for 50,000 years and ended around 374,000 years ago. Uh, so MIS-11 is important because during that era, we expect sea level to have risen between 6 and 13 meters. It's pretty significant. Um, most of the places in Florida would probably be underwater, just to give you some perspective. Am I missing a sensor or something? I'm not sure. Hang on. There we go. There we go. So this research is important um, because we want to know what's going to happen over the next several hundred years, right? Where can people live? Where will the sea level be too high? Um, and then in general, climate and ice sheet modeling is really important because it helps us understand some of these really complex climate systems in a way that you wouldn't really be able to do otherwise. Uh, so that's really the exciting part of this research. Um, for me in particular, we do regional simulations. So we're just looking in the Greenland area. And it gives us a really good idea of what's going to happen for uh, some of the really specific areas in Greenland. So we can look at the coastal areas, inland areas, and get a good idea of what it might look like. Uh, in particular, my work just aimed to produce a realistic initial state spin-up. So an initial state spin-up is just uh, the very beginning of the MIS-11 era. So we have to run the model for a couple tens of thousands of years in order for the whole system to come to an equilibrium so that once we actually start the model, we have um, an initial state that we can rely on. This summer, I ran three sets of experiments. So our first one was our present day best effort, just trying to mimic what we see today and make sure that our model parameters were fine tuned, that we know what we're working with and so we can really understand our model. And then more exciting work was for the MIS-11 era. So we used climate forcings from MIS-11 and we used some climate data from the Community Earth System model. And then we use our parallel ice sheet model, PISM, to run all of our runs. Uh, so for one of our runs, we did some bias correction um, from RACMO anomalies, which is just a climate data set. And then for another run, we did not do any bias correction. This is our first uh, little bit of data. On the right-hand side in that plot, you'll see the ice volume over time for the entire Greenland ice sheet. So you can see um, the main takeaway from this is that ice volume over time was fairly consistent between our bias corrected and our non-bias corrected models, which is great. It means we're doing something right so we can move forward. Um, and then just for reference, our present day ice sheet model, uh, if you were to place it on this graph, it would be above our upper threshold here. And the volume for that one came out at about 3.7 million kilometers cubed. And then for some pretty pictures, everyone loves to see a good map of Greenland. Um, you'll see the bias corrected and non-bias corrected models here. So if you look in those red circles, on the first model on the far left, you'll see that we have some extra ice buildup in the north and southwest regions of Greenland, which is bad. Um, sometimes that'll stop our computational box from running, so we'll have to restart all over. And we're really trying to avoid that ice buildup. Uh, so if you look in model two in the middle, you'll see that there's very little ice buildup in those regions, which is great. That is really good news for us. Uh, so this means that we're doing something right for our initial state spin up and we have a really reliable model to start with. 
And then just for some final results, in the top row, you'll see our present day best effort run. In the middle, you'll see our MIS 11 with the bias correction. And then on the bottom, you'll see our MIS 11 without bias correction. So one of the uh, measures that we use to indicate how well our models are performing is the RMSE value. And what we're looking for in climate science is to have that be as low as possible. So our middle row with the bias correction has the best overall performance, which is probably what you could have guessed. For future work, um, we want to use this initial state spin up to run full models of the entire duration of MIS 11 um, and really understand what's going to happen to the Greenland ice sheet during the current interglacial MIS 1. So we're hoping to perfect this model and then predict uh, what will happen for our children, our grandchildren, and our great grandchildren over the next several hundred years. Thank you all for coming. I'd be happy to take questions. Nicely done. Who has the first question? There we go. Why did you choose MIS 11 as opposed to another interglacial period? Good question. So MIS 11 is anomalous in that it has prolonged regional warmth. So we saw a lot of melting of the ice sheet, um, which is what we might expect during the current interglacial MIS 1. So it gives us a really good um, basis. And we have some really great paleo data from MIS 11 that we can use to confirm our models. Um, and then we can look for paleo data from MIS 1. So it's just one of the best examples we have in the past of what today might look like. Who's the next questions over here? Oh, we're doing two questions this morning. Oh, we've got one minute and fifty. Great, seconds. yeah, <laughs> this is exciting. Uh, what sort of um, what sort of geologic data do you use as like indicators to do the climate forcing? Yes, also a great question. So we use um, a couple different sets of paleo data. So we have some ice cores from Greenland, although I'll say we don't have enough. So if anyone wants to fund that, go for it. <laughs> um, and then we also have pollen records. So around Greenland, you can go around and find different pollen samples, which would indicate where the ice would have melted so that life could have formed there. Um, so we have pollen, we have ice cores, we have some sediment. So you can see where sediment um, had eroded around the coastal areas, um, indicating that the ice was melting. Um, so there's a couple different sets. And if you'd like to hear more about it, I'd be more than happy to speak with anyone afterwards. I think we have time for one more question. Great. Who had that other question? There we go. Hi. So basically what my question is, is like for the melting in MIS 11, uh, what parameters do you use? Is it like subglacial, surface, oceanic? Yeah. So it's a little bit of everything. So with these models, you can incorporate a bunch of different groups. You can look at um, like the climate, so above surface, you can do basal heating. Um, you can incorporate uh, like all of the climate parameters. So you can look at the rain, the insulation, things like that. So it's really a full picture. It incorporates everything you would want it to incorporate. Um, that's why it takes so long for these models to run and we could only do three in the summer. All right, that's it for you. And thank you so much, Riley. That was thank very you so interesting. Much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next, we want to welcome Jacob Bushy to the stage, a laboratory study on ozone effects on transpiration, carbon assimilation, and photosynthesis by perturbing stomal diffusive resistance. That's a lot with no coffee. You did great. That was really oh, good. thank you very much. All right. We had technical things this morning. Okay. All right. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. So my name is Jacob, and today I will be talking to you about my study observing the effects of ozone on transpiration, carbon assimilation, and photosynthesis in plants using a novel method. Which one is it? The green one. Green arrow. Okay. Cool. So first to start off with the basics, what is ozone? Some of y'all might remember Lily talked about yesterday. When found in the stratosphere, ozone forms a protective layer around the Earth, guarding us from the sun's damaging ultraviolet radiation. But when it forms in the troposphere, which is where we all live and breathe, it's an oxidant and a pollutant that's damaging to the plants and animals that come into contact with it. Now, one of the main uh, sinks for removal of ozone from the troposphere is uptake by plants. And that can occur either as deposition on plant surfaces or as gaseous exchange through the stomata, which is what my work focuses on. It's been well documented in the past that this gaseous exchange causes damage to the plants and reduces their photosynthetic capacity. But the mechanism by which this occurs is unknown. It could either be a physical mechanism that damages the stomata themselves or a biochemical mechanism that influences another aspect of the photosynthetic pathway or some combination of the two, we're not really sure. 
It is important though, because global carbon and water cycles are largely mediated by this biosphere atmosphere exchange of gases through the stomata. So in order to determine what this mechanism is, an experiment must be able to successfully control the amount of ozone that's being taken up by the leaf. In order to do that, you have to control the stomata, the pores on the underside of the leaf and make them more open or more closed to get more or less ozone into the plant. Experiments have done this successfully in the past, for example, by limiting light availability or inducing drought stress, causing the stomata to dilate. But as you can imagine, by changing light availability or water availability, that influences other aspects of the plant's metabolism and introduces confounding variables. Now, my method seeks to do this without any confounding variables. So what I do, I run leaf scale chamber experiments. So basically every morning I cut a leaf off of a tree, stick it in a box and expose it to different gases and see what happens. On any given day, I'll either expose it to high ozone, around 70 parts per billion, or low ozone, around 10 parts per billion. And I'm looking for how the leaf reacts to changes under those different conditions. So after I've set the ozone level, I have an atmosphere in my, a controlled atmosphere in my box that I change back and forth between zero air, which is like the air that we're all breathing right now, minus trace gases. So it's just nitrogen and oxygen. And then HELOX, which is an atmospheric analog where all of the molecular nitrogen has been replaced with helium. Now, the purpose of this switch is to uh, decrease the stomatal diffusive resistance. So helium particles are less massive than molecular nitrogen, which decreases uh, less massive particles are able to diffuse more rapidly through a space. So this allows gases to be exchanged more quickly through the stomata. This increases the transpiration rate and the stomata dilates shut in order to reduce excess water loss. And because the stomata are closing, I'm able to control the amount of ozone entering the stomata. Uh, so that solves my problem. And there are no confounding variables introduced because all I've changed is switching out molecular nitrogen for helium and both are inert. So there's no confounding effects. And while I'm changing this atmosphere back and forth between zero air and HELOX, I'm continuously monitoring carbon dioxide, water vapor, and ozone fluxes, as well as photosynthesis and leaf temperature. And you can just think of this as the leaf's vital signs. So I'm going to flip through these real quick. These are time series of my data on transpiration, carbon assimilation, as well as ozone flux and PAM-induced fluorescence. So actually, uh, a leaf fluoresces slightly proportional to the amount, to the number of electrons going through the electron transport chain. So this graph on the bottom basically just shows you how much photosynthesis is taking place. And I can revisit these more if you have any questions. Uh, but to date, the majority of my data processing has focused on transpiration. So that's where I'll draw your attention now. I'd like you to focus specifically on the data in the boxes. So uh, when I put the leaf in the chamber in the morning, it's in a regular zero air atmosphere. And then as you can see, around 930 in the morning, I switched the atmosphere from air to HELOX. That's the data plotted in orange. So what this serves to do, like I said, is decrease stomatal diffusive resistance and cause the stomata to shut. But it's not an immediate closure. The stomata actively seek a more appropriate equilibrium position to minimize transpiration, which is water loss, while still maintaining an appropriate amount of carbon dioxide uptake. And so it's not an immediate open to close situation. There's these oscillations to equilibrium, which you can see in the transpiration rate. And then around 1130, I switched the atmosphere back from uh, zero, sorry, from HELOX to air, which increases stomatal diffusive resistance. The stomata open in order to make sure enough carbon dioxide is taken up. And you see the same behavior in the opposite direction. So equilibrium position, sharp increase in transpiration, and then slight oscillations until a new equilibrium is reached. So what I'm able to do is effectively isolate the data in both boxes and chart it independently. So you can see this is an example of a high ozone day, um, the behavior of the stomata closing and opening. I'm able to do this for an ensemble of days and normalize them for comparison. So what I'm going to focus on as a metric for equilibrium being reached is the timing and the magnitude of the change from the beginning until this first trough in the oscillations. So you see, I compare between low and high ozone, and then I can do the same for stomata opening, but instead of using a trough, I'm using a peak because the transpiration rate is increasing. So what this data tells me uh, is that elevated ozone levels increase stomata sluggishness, so it takes longer for the plant to reach its new equilibrium value, and it also inhibits the stomata response to changing stimuli in general. So the magnitude of that decrease in HELOX or increase in air is smaller under high ozone conditions. So moving forward, I'd like to be able to draw more concrete conclusions on the actual mechanism taking place here. And this work has applications for remote sensing, since we'll be able to better understand how ozone influences plant fluorescence, which can be sensed in real time from towers, aircraft, and satellite. 
And understanding how the plant response to ozone influences carbon and water cycling has applications for ecosystem modeling, as well as future climate change scenarios. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank my PI, Professor Sally Pacetti, as well as co-authors Xi Yang, Manuel Lerdau, Gabriel Isaacman Van Wertz, Madeline Miles, Laura Berry, the NSF and the NASA VSGC for funding, and the ASF for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. And I can take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Who has a question? Anybody have any questions? There's a question right there. Oh, or right there. <laughs> Uh, has there been any experimentation on the prolonged effects of growing a plant in like a helox environment versus a neutral air environment? And would that have any influence on the results that you're getting now? So helox is actually kind of, uh, it's a pretty novel method. It was used back in the seventies when they were first trying to figure out things about plant physiology. It was used just to look at how water vapor concentrations in the atmosphere influence to model opening and closing. But since then it's not really been used to test pollutants. So no, nobody's ever grown it for prolonged periods. Uh, I imagine all it would do is it just increases the rate of diffusion. And so I, I assume if it's under a steady state, it wouldn't really have any serious effects. All right. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for. But if you want to connect more, let's join up afterwards. So thank you, Jacob. Very well done. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome John Patziger from Purdue University investigating polymers. I left out the middle part. I, I know you do. Give me one second. Come on, open up for me. The green button goes forward. Yep. Hang on one second, John, sorry. Oh, you're good. Yeah, I did that one, but I did it here. Why isn't this showing? One moment, please. Yes, I know we can. There we go. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. So hello, everybody. My name is John Putziger, and I'm an organic chemist from Purdue University. And as you can tell by the introduction, this is actually a pretty scary title. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> it was a pretty scary title. But have any of you guys actually seen like the new Samsung folding phones or the Mozilla phones? Mm -hmm. So got a couple of you. The big thing that you got to know is that the type of polymers I'm making are semiconducting, and they can actually be used in those types of foldable electronics. So they have the application in the industrial sphere for having those new types of technologies. So in terms of the purpose of why we even wanted to study isomeric polymers in the first place is that previous research has been done regarding the use of isomers in making tunable electronics. But the issue really comes down to the fact of what types of isomers have been used previously and a lot of them caused inherent structural differences in the polymers. So there wasn't really an easy way to be able to understand how you tune your materials for the properties you want. So we came out and we use these three isomers. So they're all fairly planar. They are all differing in the position of the nitrogen about the ring. And from that, you're easily able to understand what the influences of small molecular changes do on the properties of your polymers and their structures. So as you can see over here, we use a diketo pyrolo pyrolo uh, center with some thiophenes on the side. And with that, you are able to use a palladium catalyst, toss in the microwave reactor, and afterwards you get a long chain polymer that you're able to investigate afterwards. So from this, we were able to, in coordination with uh, people from USM and University of Kentucky, be able to use a couple of different analytical methods to better understand the properties of these materials. And it's not moving on the side. Don't worry. So I'd like to highlight the uh, three most important uh, pieces of analytical tools that we use within the study. The first, oh. <laughs> the first one being uh, ultraviolet visual spectroscopy right over here. The second being uh, Gray's incident X-ray spectroscopy. And the last being uh, UPS and IPES. And really all that means is that you're able to tell the energy of the lowest conducting band and highest conducting band. And that really just tells you what its electrical properties are and how it's able to conduct. So the first one being UV vis, it's just light coming in and how much it is able to absorb. And that's really telling you the differences in the energies of the materials. And when you change the three isomers, you're able to see that the energies of the materials are very changing and you're able to see it 
pretty easily from the data. The second being X-ray spectroscopy. All it's telling you is that you have differences in crystallinity and that's able to affect the conductivity of your material and how it's actually working within your device. Lastly being UPS and IPES, there is a difference in conductivity and it's just telling you that how it's influencing your packing and your structure is changing how it's able to affect your conductivity and how it's used in modern devices. So overall, within these three analytical tools and throughout the rest of the study, we're able to show the isomer effect in full force and that small changes in the isomeric structure was able to cause big differences within the final properties of your materials. So overall, the impact of the study is that you're able to show with these different isomers that you're able to fine tune your materials for use in industrial and academic applications, which is very useful because of the fact that if you can have these small differences is able to better create materials that have very specific uh, needs that you're going for. So thank you very much. Any questions? Well done. There's a question right there. Start there, please. Thank you for those who are running with the microphone. We appreciate you taking all those steps. Hi, John. Thank you for your talk, by the way. So uh, I'm pretty interested in the ap future applications that you see with your work. I see it seems like your uh, polymers mostly operate in the near IR and red regime of the visible spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you did talk about it being in a Samsung phone. So how, which part of the phone, well, I'm assuming a screen is what you're doing. So actually a lot of the research has been done into printable electronics. So essentially it can work as the back bed of your electronic system. So think about it like the PCB or the microcontroller on the back end that allows for the flow of electricity through your system. So a tiny bit of research has been done on this display. This all spins on the back end. So it's got a lot of flexible applications in that case, but research is still being done on finding the specific uh, use for it. I see, thank you. Next question. There. Thank you. How did you choose like the initial uh, polymer structure? Like all of those isomers, were those specific for conductance or well, what went into that decision process? So the isomers specifically had been used previously in research because of the fact that they did have conducting properties and that they were, in the case, conjugated. So they had electrons flowing about the ring. So they would already have the ability to be used in these conducting systems. But specifically why they were used is the fact that they did have the novel property that all the structures were planar. So with that, you were able to definitely find control what you were looking at and what was actually influencing the final properties. So they had the conducting pattern, but they're able to narrow down what is actually being affected for fine tuning, which was not done previously. We have time for one more question. So something I feel like the industry people might want to know is how high is your yield for the polymerization reaction? So the yield, I believe we got about, at least in terms of the molecular weight that's more processable, processable and well usable, I think was about 55 to 60%. Uh, with polymerizations, unless you have really nailed down your synthetic technique, there's actually some issues where it can either be too low of a molecular weight or too high of a molecular weight. So after you send it over to industry, most likely some chemical engineers will better tune the reaction parameters. But at least right now in the academic sense, it's around 55 to 60. All right. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting. Appreciate your time. All right. Next, we want to welcome Teddy. Teddy's going to talk to us about enhancing optical nonlinearities through the quantum engineering of interband materials. And this will make me speak better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm glad I'm coming after John. So he's already primed you guys a little bit about semiconductor star. I'm a rising I'm Teddy Share, rising senior at University of Texas at Austin. Today I'll be talking about enhancing optical nonlinearities to the quantum engineering of interband materials. So that's quite a mouthful. So, but <laughs> Okay, luckily for you, we're gonna start with a little motivation and background on what nonlinear non optics is before moving on to our simulation work, conclusions and acknowledgements. So you're probably thinking to yourself, why, why am I here? Why am I listening to this guy talk about something I have never heard of? Well, what you should know is that the extensive impact of nonlinear optics has been felt across a variety of disciplines. 
anywhere from in physics, where we can make a lot of different lasers, pro including probably this green laser pointer that I'm using right here, to uh, in surgery, where femtosecond pulse laser modulated by nonlinear mode locking has allowed for safe cataract removal. In fact, in fabrication, we can get exquisite control in three dimensions using nonlinear processes, chemistry, dual cone spectroscopy for chemical analysis, and even in clinical trials, microscopic imaging enabled by nonlinear optics gives you something like this used for liver fibrosis diagnosis. So obviously this thing is very important, but many of you are probably thinking, what is this thing that we're talking about? <laughs> so let's start with a little bit on what polarization is. So I want you to imagine, or just look at the string of a simple atomic model where we have a nucleus and electron cloud. Now, since they are charged, if you apply an external electric field, you're going to spatially distort those charges like you stretch a spring. And we call that distortion polarization. Under most conditions, we can model it with a linear equation. Here you see uh, electric field strength, and in front of it is a chi constant that we call susceptibility. Now that is very important because it is a characteristic of the material system that you're in. So the stronger your chi, the larger the polarization, and more efficient and higher strength your optical processes will be. Now to get a better model of what polarization actually is, we take this power series expansion, where you take into account of the higher order contributions to your polarization. And we specifically are interested in the second order contributions and the subsequent chi two in front of it. Now, if we take, look, take a look at typical values for chi two, it is extraordinarily weak. We are in the picometers per volt. How do we enhance that? What you see here on the right is an image of a digital alloy. What it basically is, is a bunch of thin layers of semiconductor materials stack one atop of one another. Now there's two things you should know about these things. One, when you zoom out macroscopically, they approximate the bulk properties of one homogeneous alloy. So the layers kind of blend together. But when you zoom in, those layers are still there. So locally, you get energy diagrams that look like that graph on the right, where as you go from layer to layer, you get variations in energy. Now, the low energy quantum well regions is where your electron and pole wave functions will be mostly confined in. Now, recall the polarization we talked about. If you put an electric field, say, with an incident light, you're going to get the wave function to slosh in between adjacent wells. And that sloshing is where we can get a lot of our optical process controls. Now, the more observant amount you might have already thought about, hey, since these quantum wells are controlled by the layers, we can tune very simple knobs during fabrication that can allows us to scope the wave function to what we want it to be. So that's what we're depicting on the bottom two graphs there. As we change the relative layer thickness from symmetric to asymmetric quantum wells, that's the line in blue, what you see is the wave function change drastically. So why do we care about that? Well, for completeness, this is the equation we use in our simulation. Don't worry, it's not gonna be on the test, but <laughs> I do wanna direct your attention to these two things. That Those two terms come from that sloshing we talked about. And under most condition and most symmetric materials, they cancel out to near zero. That's why our chi two is so low. However, if we can tune it, our quantum well stack sequences and layer thicknesses, we can gain quantum control of our material properties, which will translate directly into enhanced nonlinear strengths. And we've demonstrated this experimentally, anywhere from 10 to 25 X increases. But how, why, and when these enhancements occur, we still need to figure that out. And we will know by doing simulations such as these. This is the same type of graph that you've seen before. As we change the relative quantum well thicknesses, you get drastic changes in your wave function. Now, this is the end result of what chi two looks like. 
And what you notice is that our work in red has two peaks compared to the one peak predicted by theory. And that is very exciting because what it means is we have uncovered an unexpected mechanism that is driving uh, nonlinear enhancement that was missed by theory. How often do you hear something like that in a physics talk? <laughs> so in conclusion, we have found, it, we have simulated quantum well uh, nonlinearities with our chi two coefficient. We've talked about how digital alloys gives you exquisite control over not just your bulk properties and also in your, quant uh, your wave functions, allowing us to engineer a plurality of functionality into a single material. Next steps will include things like trying to align those peaks using something called highly mismatched alloys. You can ask about me that later. Uh, ask me about that later. But uh, I think my time is almost up. So let's talk a little bit about acknowledgement. Thank you to NSF, Dr. Bank, and Alex Skipper for their help on this project. And I will take your questions now. Thank you very much. We have time for about one question. Who's got a question? Somebody's got a question. Anybody? Bueller, there we go. Bueller. What is the thickness of your layers? Yeah, so that's one of the things that we're tuning. So I only showed you changes in relative thickness layers, but um, the ones that were most interesting right now is about five nanometers or 10 nanometers for the both of those quantum wells. So very, very thin. Any, we have, nope, we're done with questions, but. I do want to point out one thing before we let Teddy go. Remember yesterday we talked about lyrical expressions? This presentation was an excellent example. You used words like extraordinary, exquisite. Exquisite is a very lyrical word that you don't often hear in physics. So I wanted to just point that out. That was really beautiful. Thank you very much, Teddy. Next, we want to welcome Maggie Nelson from Auburn University. And Maggie, I want to get your presentation going. And Maggie will be talking to us about recycled shape memory polymers. So go ahead. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Maggie Nelson. I am a rising junior at Auburn University studying aerospace engineering. And today I'm going to be discussing the processing and application of recycled shape memory polymers. Did you say it was the green button? It was the green button. Oh. Okay. So sustainable practices in engineering are vital to satisfying our present societal needs without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. The importance of this topic is becoming increasingly obvious across all domains of engineering, from addressing erratic climates here on Earth to long duration missions up in space. Sustainability applied to materials in engineering focuses on altering the systems we have put in place that contribute to large wastes of time, finances, and resources, including products with a limited service life. An important concept in sustainability is the circular economy, which seeks to reduce waste materials, reuse materials when possible, and then recycle materials as necessary. My research, as you can tell, focuses specifically on this recycling of materials. Now, the materials I am recycling are shape memory polymers. Shape memory polymers are a material that can change shape in response to thermal stimuli. This shape change can be used for many significant applications, including the deployment of space structures. In our lab specifically, we use shape memory polymers as a way to fold complex shapes in a process called self-folding origami. Samples absorb infrared light and ink pattern regions and fold due to a gradient in temperature and shrinking. Although these materials are highly useful for their ability to form complex structures, they're typically only used once and must be disposed of upon the decommissioning of the structure. Therefore, the processing and characterization of recycled shape memory polymers is important uh, to quantify the viability of the recycled material for specific aerospace applications. Utilizing a desktop polymer recycling system, excess shape memory polymer is extruded to form a recycled polymer resin that is then formed into flat sheets of material through controlled applications of heat and pressure for reuse. Eventually, a 3D printing filament will also be produced for additive manufacturing applications, such as rapid prototyping of specialty tools and low volume injection molds. 
Another application of recycled shape memory polymers includes reuse as actuators for deployable structures. Are you? Okay. So sorry. <laughs> so previous works have failed to investigate the effects of recycling on the shape memory effect of shape memory polymers. There is evidence that the recycling process leads to degradation of the polymer at a molecular level that will then influence the performance of its shape memory capabilities by altering the viscoelastic properties of the material. Um, this degradation is evidenced through temperature sweep testing with dynamic mechanical analysis, um, D or DMA. DMA testing subjects the material to an oscillatory strain and records the force that occurs. The results of this testing allows one to discern the time and temperature dependent mechanical properties of the material. For my analysis, I observed the changes that occurred, or lack thereof, to the storage modulus, loss modulus, and loss angle in reference to frequency. Here, I show the viscoelastic master curves from zero to six extrusions. The data was analyzed to quantify the peak of the loss angle or tan delta curve in terms of frequency, bandwidth, and area underneath the curve. Analysis of the tan delta curve was used because it accounts for changes to both the storage and loss modulus. Um, so as you can see, the changes are very minimal. Um, and so the similarity, we basically observed that there are no clear trends to the changes in viscoelastic properties of up to six times extruded material. Additionally, the glassy behavior of the material remains constant with increased recycling. Therefore, there is minimal degradation of up to six times recycled uh, material as evidenced by DMA. Um, however, the material does physically degrade as can be seen through the increased clouding of the multi-extruded sample. Based on this information, uh, recycled shape memory polymers are still viable for aerospace applications throughout these six tested extrusions and should be able to retain their significant shape memory capabilities. By investigating recycled shape memory polymers, we are attempting to establish the limits and abilities of the recycled material as a viable resource for in-situ resource utilization. The farther humans go into deep space, the more important it becomes to establish sustainable infrastructures to allow for enduring exploration. So thank you to ASF for giving me this opportunity and thank you everybody for your time. Why is it my there it is? I was wondering if you could go into, uh, I figure you probably might not be allowed to talk about what the polymers themselves are. That probably has some sort of trademark with it. Can you uh, talk about it? Yeah, if you would. <laughs> well, what's going on with yeah. those and what's the recycling process look like? Do you just melt them down or is there some other process? Yeah, so we use polystyrene specifically. And the reason I can talk about this is because, does anyone know what shrinky dinks are, the toy? Mm -hmm. It's essentially that. Um, so <laughs> it's already pretty well known. Uh, and the recycling process, it's uh, essentially me having, I, I use uh, old CD cases because those are essentially obsolete now. So we have a lot of those on campus. <laughs> so I'll smash those up into pieces with a hammer and <laughs> then I'll feed those pieces into an extruder that'll you know, break down the material more, melt it down so it forms a continuous profile. Then I'll spiral it by hand to get it into uh, a little like plate, place it between aluminum plates and then melt it down again in a hot press so that I have a flat sheet. Um, and then I cut it up to test the DMA and eventually um, I plan to wind it into a 3D printing filament straight from the extruder. So that would minimize some of the process. Yeah. We have time for one more quick question. Yeah, that was a really fun presentation. Um, I've tried to capture, like, characterize thin film in a DMA before, and like, utterly failed at it. Like, how did you capture the actual material properties and not just like a byproduct of like plain strain, like just like geometric distortion, right? Yeah. So I had to learn from the people around me. This was my first time using the DMA, so there was a lot of trial and error. A lot of the times, my results would be completely unusable. 
Uh, I had a lot of noise in some of the viscoelastic master curves, and so they were not clean. So you essentially could not get any information. Um, but using the skills of the people before me, they helped me fine tune. I had to adjust the strain. So I use about like a 0.01% strain and then adjust the axial force for the additional, like the initial conditioning of the material to about between one to two newtons, depending on if it's virgin material or the six times recycled. But yeah, I had to play around with it a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Here's your notes because you said you wanted. So wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, if you need some more CD cases, let me know. I'll send them to you from my obsolete collection. All right, next, let us welcome Julian Moreno from the University of Kansas. We're gonna be addressing some risks associated with integrating integration of autonomous unmanned aircraft in urban areas. Oui, you. you're welcome. All right, how many uh, online shopping addicts we have in here? <laughs> All right, some of you are liars. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, looking this way, because my wife's over in the back. I can't look that way. When <laughs> all right. Green button forward. Here you go. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about integration of unmanned vehicles in urban areas. And as you can assume, this is a very growing topic, and it's going to continue to grow. Um, I brought up the deliveries, so I know Amazon um, is planning to do this. You can think of air taxis. So um, NASA's urban air mobility uh, mission statement up there. Um, it actually defines a lot of these problems. So we're going to talk about three of them today. Uh, collision avoidance with fixed and di dynamic objects. So think of uh, buildings or other aircraft that possibly collide with. Um, we're also going to talk about um, constrained maneuverability problems. Obviously, aircraft are going to have trouble uh, maneuvering in between buildings or you know, there's a lot of obstacles, power lines, stuff like that. Um, then we're also going to talk about um, takeoff and landing operations. So it's very inconsistent. Um, I know a lot of you guys like to land aircraft in the middle of a street in video games, but that's not real life. So that's definitely a problem we have to solve. Uh, uh, so a uh, quick background. Uh, so our lab, um, the Kansas uh, Flight Research Lab, is um, GNC related, so guidance, navigation, control. Um, that's a little bit out of order when you think about it. So going over it real quickly. Um, usually start with navigation. Um, so that's going to be where the aircraft is right now, where it wants to be, and then the desired path to get there. Um, guidance is going to be how do I change the current state of the aircraft to achieve the desired path? And then you get into controls, which is how do I actually physically change the aircraft, uh, whether it be you know ailerons for rolling, uh, throttle if you want to go faster. How do you actually change the uh, aircraft to achieve desired path, essentially? Um, all right. uh, so solving the first problem that I brought up in the slide, um, collision avoidance. So we've actually developed an um, intelligent collision avoidance algorithm. It's both scalable and adaptable. It can be used for a number of agents. Uh, so the thing that uh, this uses uh, potential or morphs potential fields, and um, it does this in a variety of ways uh, that considers the dynamics and physical constraints of an aircraft which a lot of the people that have used this before uh, don't consider. They just consider point masses, which can move in any direction in any uh, given amount of time. But aircraft actually have um, constraints. So we morph in the direction of the relative velocity, which commands less aggressive maneuvering, which is very important for um, wing loading and you know just uh, you know, not turning aggressively, which can be bad for a number, number of components. Um, and then also um, has consensus back to desired trajectory. So if you avoid an object, um, you may want to get back on the desired path, um, especially if you're like an autopilot type of mode. Um, solving maneuverability, um, we've developed a novel guidance logic, which performs superior compared to traditional guidance logics. Um, and it does this by cognitively updating the maneuverability of the aircraft. Um, so it does this based off of in-flight data acquisition. Um, as you can see up there, the green line is um, the um, novel uh, guidance logic that we've developed. And it tracks it better, and eventually it ends up with a zero path following error. And um, as you see here, um, it's done through these uh, legs. We have a number of legs, and they all have a different weighting assigned to them. And that's updated based off of the aircraft feels that, you know, maybe it 
took the turn too tightly, it might update those and then vice versa. Um, and then solving like a, a landing and takeoff scenario. So obviously we're gonna have to develop um, different type of test beds. In this case, we deal a lot with VTOLs. We actually manufacture and design all of these in-house. Um, we use a lot of different tools, whether it be like finite element analysis. Um, and then I brought up here the uh, dynamic analysis. We use DAR Corporation's advanced aircraft analysis for that. And it actually allows us to estimate a lot of the dynamic characteristics of these aircraft. Um, so you get stability control derivatives and stuff like that. So you can see if your aircraft is inherently stable or not before you actually build it, which is very important. And then moment of inertia estimation. This is very important for any sort of angular rotational motion of an aircraft. Um, and there's not a lot of um, accurate testing done unless you're willing to spend a lot of money, but um, with small UAVs, it's a little harder. So this is one of our VTOLs, Eris. Uh, it's a foam board VTOL. Um, that was the dynamic model and AAA for that. And then you can see it here in real life, looks pretty similar. Um, so this is us swing testing it this summer. Um, you see the data on the right. Um, so this is for roll testing. So IXX, the moment of inertia about the X axis. Um, so we did 20 tests here. We just swing it um, and then you get the roll rate. So accelerations off of that. And then using logarithmic decrement, actually, you can back into damping a natural frequency and then you can actually calculate moment of inertia through that. Um, so we do that with various um, axes. Um, to get the more important moments of inertia. So if anyone's interested in that, you can uh, come talk to me after, and I'll use sources for those. Um, so wrapping up, um, just goals for future research. Um, so obviously, we want to develop safe and robust ways to solve a lot of these problems. So like I said, it's going to be a growing um, realm in the future. I mean, it's already pretty big. So and we want safe ways to do that, and we can do that through um, intelligent controllers. So we have a lot of grad students working on artificial intelligence and machine learning um, with controllers. That's something I definitely plan on getting into, especially in grad school. And then uh, we want to test the multi-agent collision avoidance in uh, real life, which it's a little difficult, um, as you can imagine. So um, that's definitely plans for the future. Uh, I want to thank ASF for having us here. I'm glad to be here with all of you guys. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Julian. All right, who's got the first question? This gentleman in the third row. Here we come. So you're so you're talking about making those, you know, stability simulations. And so I'm I'm imagining this for like the package delivery kinds of applications. Like, aren't those packages such a substantial part of those, you know, just the physical geometry of those? Like, are there ways that you can account for that? Or is that things you're thinking about yet? Or is that kind of mm -hmm. down the road? Yeah, obviously that's um, that's a good question, uh, first off, but um, that's something you're gonna have to consider um, when you are doing the analysis. So um, usually you'll have different iterations for that and you're gonna kind of know when you have a test bed um, what it's gonna be used for. So you can kind of estimate that. And obviously it's not perfect. So that's where um, post-processing um, like flight test data will come into account. Um, obviously you're gonna test it a lot before then. So um, usually you can kind of, get a better, um, you kind of um, uh, look at what the stability control derivatives you get off of the software and then compare them. And usually it converges to somewhat similar. So, but that's something you're gonna have to test for each case, so. And that's all the questions we have time for, but if you have more, please find Julian later. But Julian, thank you very much. Can we get an aircraft that will deliver Starbucks to my hotel room? <laughs> Just asking. All right, we'd next like to welcome Britton Steele from Mississippi State University on the acoustic levitator on a UAV. Woo! Woo! Woo hoo! How's it going, everybody? Awesome, Good. awesome, awesome. So, my name is Britton Steele. I'm a Mississippi State Bulldog, as she said. I'm a part of the class of 2024, so I'm a pretty young guy, um, and I'm majoring in aerospace engineering and business, and today I'll be presenting to y'all about the implementation of an acoustic levitator intended for an unmanned aerial vehicle 
otherwise known as a UAV? The screen button. Green. Yeah, we all went to ask him. <laughs> Okay, so let's start off with the basics. So what is an acoustic levitator? Uh, acoustic levitator is, uh, acoustic levitation is a method of suspending matter and air against gravity utilizing acu acoustic radiation pressure um, from high intensity sound waves. A lot of big words. Main point from this that I wanted to um, demonstrate is that an ultra ultrasonic acoustic levitator is a system that maintains its acoustic suspension. So what are a few factors that we have to overcome when trying to develop a system that can maintain this acoustic su uh, suspension? So two of the biggest challenges that we faced were to try to develop a sign that can overcome uh, sustainability issues and mobility issues. And it was my task as a freshman to design a construct that can overcome uh, these two challenges. And we figured the best way to possibly do so was to attach this acoustic levitator on the bottom of a UAV as a payload. And the picture right there just demonstrates some applications of acoustic levitation used in laboratories. So how does this stuff work? How do you even begin with trying to lift up an object with sound? I get that question a lot when talking about my research, and it can be quite confusing. Um, but acoustic levitation uh, with an acoustic levitator specifically is uh, as square waves generate or generate electronically through Adreno Nano and then amplified by a motor driver in the system circuit. From there, the square waves are then translated into sensorial waves, aka your basic sound wave with high peaks and low valleys, and then um, sent to the ultrasonic transducers. Ultrasonic transducers, a big word for basically just describing a uh, speaker. Uh, from there, uh, the ultrasonic um, transducers create an acoustic radiation force, which is what acoustic levitation uh, describes. and this is the, where the magic happens, which I get really excited about. So if I get a little shaky, I apologize. But uh, <laughs> so when two waves collide, it creates a phenomenon that's called a standing wave. And in this bottom picture right here, you can go, oh, oh, back. I just back. Where's the laser? Here we go. Right here. And for anybody that's a visual learner like me, this is, this is def definitely very helpful when trying to learn about this uh, phenomenon. And what happens is that these transducers have to, um, they oscillate when they send a wave, and the opposite side of the transducer has to oscillate in the opposite direction, creating this non-pressure pocket. And this imitates a low gravity environment, and that's where we can put an object within this space to lift it. And the next step was to decide a frame that could be attached to a UAV for this technology. So right here, as you can see, this is the system that I just quickly 3D printed on a low budget. Um, right here, uh, this frame, the battery DC converter uh, fit on top of this, stacked atop of one another with a thin piece of cardboard in between to reduce overheating. And then the Andrino Nano and the driver are placed in the bottom. Now about the transducers, we put a, we 3D printed a conic structure with the transducers on the inside, and then used a strong adhesive to attach it to the bottom. So when the system gets attached, it will be on a downward orientation. So there were three main testing objectives that we had to accomplish. Uh, and one of those was that the circuit needs to be able to handle 20 volts. And this was very, very a difficult process because the Adreno Nano can only uh, withstand six to 20 volts. And, but the equipment uh, that we use with the driver and the transducers needed more than 20 volts. So we, that that was a really key part with the DC converter. Next, we had to make sure that every transducer uh, produced the correct frequency and amplitude. And then if those two were satisfied, then we had to actually test the sustained levitation within the system for five or more minutes. So uh, the first objective, a battery almost blew up on my face, short story. Uh, <laughs> And that was pretty incredible uh, for my first research project. Uh, but <laughs> after that, we quickly replaced it, and the uh, system was able to withstand 20 volts. Uh, the second objective was satisfied because we used an oscilloscope to test every transducer. And as intended, the counterpart transducers um, that were on the other half of the um, conic shape, they also produced an opposite oscillation, which was as intended to create that standing wave or standing wave phenomenon. And then the third, which is the exciting part, and you'll get to see some pretty pictures on the next slide, is that 
we were uh, we took a piece of styrofoam, a little ball, and we shoved it into that trap. And we levitated objects for five or more minutes, which is pretty cool. I wish I could show you all the video, but <laughs> so yeah. So right here, you can see that this is upward static levitation. This lasted. All these pictures lasted for more than twenty minutes, which is pretty incredible, as we're not in a vacuum. Uh, <laughs> and from there, some of the so sadly, we did not get access to Raspit Flight Center to actually touch on the UAV. So please get in contact with me. I can get you in touch with the acoustic levitation team about this process and it's very very exciting uh once granted access we're just going to use zip ties to connect it to the bottom plate of uh, the unmanned aerial vehicle and i really do believe that this technology can revolutionize our industry julian briefly mentioned about you know delivering packages one problem that we have is that a lot of drones that are designed for that they just have a fixed claw to lift up objects with this all you need to do is put the center of the mass of the object in it whatever size as long as the system is proportional and has enough voltage you can lift those objects and who knows maybe you can get a starbucks drink that is floating towards you in the future <laughs> and so i just want to thank asf and everybody for uh, getting me here uh, this is my first presentation i'm so happy to be a part of this family and um, i'm having a blast so thank you guys, and I'll open the floor for Thank you, Brittany. One quick question. We have time for one quick question. White shirt. No, no, okay. We'll talk later. Uh, awesome presentation. You did really well for your first time. Mm -hmm. thank, you, thank, um, you, thank you. What are the current mass limitations for the system that you built, and how do you see it scaling in the future? Yeah, so that is very, very interesting. So mass limitations with this. So with the acoustic levitator, you have to deal with the mass of that. But when you put the object within that trap, we haven't done testing yet on the UAV, but we're we're anticipating that that mass will significantly reduce. So that challenge that was presented in Julian's problem could be solved with this technology. Uh, how to further progress this uh, technology to be better and be more sustainable is that that acoustic levitator only had one conic shape. There's actually other acoustic levitator signs that we're currently studying that uses multiple of those in a, a spherical array all facing one another. The more transducer speakers that you have on one part and the more powerful voltage that you have, that trap um, stays more form, firm. Okay. Wonderful, well done, well done, thank you. All right, let's welcome Joseph Kirchhoff from Purdue University, efforts towards large-scale composite fabrication. Woohoo! All right, are you ready? I'll give you all a time into it. All I'll right, the clicker's right there, and you just press the green button. Good deal. Okay, let's dive into it. Who here is familiar with composites? Just like a show of hands, gauge the room. Okay, good. Not a ton of people. So I'm going to say a really high level, right? No reason to like dive into the, like, the weeds. So I want everyone to like feel your t-shirt, feel your t-shirt, like your mask. Like carbon fiber really feels like your mask like when it's like just a cloth. Um, but like, you know, when you're like eating your pancakes and you like spill syrup on your shirt, it gets a little crispy there, like after the later in the day, pretty exciting, right? But like, would you build an airplane out of your like t-shirt with syrup on it? No. Well, fortunately I spilled syrup on my mask early this morning. And so you start getting really cool properties, right? In your mask along this length, you have some more strength along the fiber direction. And then once you put like your like syrup on it, eventually you start getting a pretty cool material. Um, carbon fiber is ultimately 10 times lighter than steel, about four times stronger. So pretty cool, right? Um, but now imagine like building an airplane out of your t-shirt or carbon fiber. It's a really tricky problem. And that's really where I want to guide this presentation. Um, how do you do these large scale composite structures in a quick method? Um, a kind of a misconception is that carbon fiber is a, like a wonder material that doesn't really see its way to your lives. You know, like almost all of you flew on a plane today that was like, might be a majority carbon fiber at this point. Um, like tennis rackets, tons of sporting equipment, cars, tons and tons of applications nowadays. Um, and historically there was hand layup. So you had technicians in a room laying down carbon fiber and it was a pretty slow process. Uh, my teammate this past summer invented something called automated fiber placement, AFP. This is an AFP process of laying down a 777X bar at the Boeing company. Um, there's tons and tons of different methods for different applications, but for the, like, the really only understanding is like, there's, it's a really robust thing. It's a really exciting field. Um, 
And once you like lay down your carbon fiber in your form, you take it into an autoclave, which is a really large oven that's pressurized and maintains the two. Um, but like throw back to like Julian's and Britain's presentations. Imagine a process where you wanted to create UAVs at such a large scale that you can actually become profitable. Well, Boeing ran a case study and we realized that you would require the entire energy grid of Washington, Oregon, and California every single day if you wanted to reach the rates to become profitable. That's a problem, right? And so now we're starting to look at alternative methods like compression molding. That's a pretty fun thing for thermoplastics. Um, but really where I go into the play is additive manufacturing. Um, large scale additive manufacturing, this is Thermoids Printer, a pretty new company. They, they print entire boats out of carbon fiber. Pretty cool stuff. Um, it's like, why would we jump through all of these hoops to create composites, right? Like, why are they that valuable? And there's tons and tons of reasons. But for the, like, the driving factor in the aerospace industry is weight savings. If you can like, create a lighter plane, then you're gonna save so much money on, on fuel. And that's really what's gonna engage your airlines, right? It's like the, triple, uh, the 787 Dreamliner is a really good case study for that. Um, and so what I want you to take away from this presentation, a really like goal for mine, is why it's really important for academia and industry to collaborate. I've been on both sides of the equation. I've researched composites for five years in academic labs and then two internships with the Boeing company. And on both sides, it's a totally different scale and different perspective, but if you reach in the middle, you have a really cool thing. Um, I personally don't want to fly on a plane where there's every single part hasn't been like, computationally understood. So like, if we don't understand the math well enough to predict that your part's not going to fail, I don't really want to step on that plane. And we're getting there, right? <laughs> um, so like in academia, you're really driven by the science. You're really driven by the goal to understand these materials at a better level. Um, these are just screenshots of a couple papers and projects I've worked on. Um, and just like to show you that you're down in the roots, you really are. And sometimes you kind of like lose track of your way. Um, whereas in industry, you're looking at these huge scales, right? Like the picture on the top right is a large AFP machine down in Charleston building a 787 barrel. Um, like I worked on a project with the Boeing company where we prepared data that we presented to the Congress. Um, taking that a couple of steps further, like these are just huge scales. That picture on the bottom left is a new building, and all it does is make the, seven, eight, the 777X wings. And we're talking huge, huge scale. That's like a three, four million square foot building just to make the wings. Um, and so like, how do you meet in the middle, right? You have one group that's really driven by profits, one group that's driven by science. Well, like, guess what? We've done it. Um, like, <laughs> I work at a lab cooking the Composite Manufacturing Simulation Center, and we've collaborated with Boeing to use compression molding, or we kind of coined a new term, um, where we can create brackets for airplanes out of thermoplastic composites at a really fast rate, and we fully understand the physics phenomena behind it. We've created digital twins that predict the behavior of these materials, and so I'm really confident when I step on that plane, right? And that's a great thing. Um, this upcoming year, I'm collaborating with Thermwood, the company I showed you earlier, and a company in Switzerland called 9T Labs to print, print continuous fiber composites. Um, and so like, why am I capable to solve these problems, to work in this field? Well, like, I really want to give credit to the people that have like, come before me, like my mentors along the way, um, between the different like, managers of the Boeing company and the different research labs. Um, really. Like going forward, I want to apply advanced data science and AI to predict material behavior, and specifically in composites. Um, just open the floor to questions. Well done, thank you. Where's our first question? Kurt. Yeah, so that's a really fun question. Um, the question was, can you like capture the data in composites? Um, metals show deformation, right? You hit metal with something, you're gonna see or like you're gonna see a surface defect. Whereas with composites, it could be hidden within your inner, inner laminar properties. Um, what he's hinting at is your when your airline goes flight after flight after flight, how do you capture that data? Um, currently, the like standard is it's really process driven. So in a lab, we fatigue test materials to like, I don't know. 7,000 flight hours, and we get a good understanding that defects form or like cracking propagates at a certain point. Um, moving forward, you want to get away from process controls because that's a really like cost inhibited practice. Um, and data modeling and FEA is a really, really hot topic right now. And I personally don't think it's where it needs to be. Um, and part of the limitation for that is I think we've tried to apply um, damaged properties from metals, or like, the, the, like the heritage of metals, to composites. So like fatigue testing and like crack propagation of a circle. 
we use very similar equations. And I don't think that's the solution. Um, so I, I do think that's a really cool, exciting field. Um, I hope I answered your question, but. Good deal. <laughs> yeah, it's very process driven. All right. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. Next, we want to welcome Alexander Metcalf from Syracuse University. Investigation of hybrid powertrain used, utilizing solid oxide fuel cells and internal combustion engine for unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs. I know what you're thinking, another UAV guy. <laughs> My hope is that yeah, after this thinking. presentation, we'll have a carbon fiber UAV transporting your Starbucks coffee with a floating, <laughs> levitating thing, you know, with this, uh, this system. So, Love it. so good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Metcalf. I'm a 2021 scholar. I'm a rising senior at Syracuse University studying aerospace engineering. And today I'll be presenting on my work investigation of a hybrid powertrain utilizing solid oxide fuel cells and internal combustion engine for unmanned aerial vehicles. Now, I know this is probably the longest title you've seen all weekend. Uh, <laughs> so really the important thing to draw from this is the hybrid powertrain aspect, which means that we're drawing from two sources of power. So what is a UAV? A UAV is an unmanned aerial vehicle, also commonly referred to as a drone. Uh, it has no onboard operator and can be operated either autonomously or with a remote control device. The hybrid system that I'm proposing is for a small to medium sized UAV, which ranges from zero to 50 kilograms, which is comparable to some of the UAVs you may have seen, uh, but also reaches into the higher weight classes. So also, what is a solid oxide fuel cell? Uh, from the schematic on the left, we can see that a solid oxide fuel cell consists of three distinct layered layers, an anode, a cathode, and an electrolyte. Now, the cool thing about solid oxide fuel cells is as long as they're introduced to fuel and oxidant, they will continue to create power, unlike something like a household battery, which runs out of power eventually. Now, this schematic on the left, also, you can see it can be drawn out into a sort of tubular fashion, uh, which is known as a microtubular SOFC, uh, which makes more sense when looking at the schematic on the right, which is a collection of microtubular SOFCs known as a fuel cell stack. Um, and in that schematic, the regions of oxidant and fuel are then kept completely separate. Now to motivate this project, UAVs are being increasingly used for land, crop, water, resource surveys, as well as in military applications. However, the common lithium polymer battery used to power them can only power flight for about 30 minutes. The hybrid system plans to use a lithium, uh, liquid uh, hydrocarbon fuel that is much more energy dense than the lithium polymer batteries, which increases flight duration and hence increases the flight duration, um, which increases the usability in these sorts of applications. Now for our approach. We start with a two-stroke internal combustion engine, which can be seen in some higher end RC cars. Um, this will intake the fuel and, and create mechanical shaft power, which can be harnessed by the electrical generator. Uh, the two-stroke engine will also uh, create syngas-rich exhaust, which will be routed to the SOFC for it to create its power. Now, syngas is hydrocarbons at elevated temperatures, which uh, is an ideal fuel source for the SOFC. And it's important to note that the exhaust from these sorts of engines, as we know from driving our cars every day, is usually a, a waste product. Uh, but in this case, we are routing it to the SOFC for increased power. Uh, the power from both the electrical generator and the SOFC can be routed to onboard rotors for power generation for, for flight. So in a full system test, we were able to use the smart engine break-in system to simulate loading on the engine as if it were actually operating inside an RC car, for example. And we situated the SOFC in the exhaust of this. We were able to monitor the performance of the SOFC using a Keithley source meter and we were able to generate these graphs on the right. I know it's probably a little small for the people in the back, um, but I'll go ahead and explain it. The blue line shows the OCV or open circuit voltage versus the current density. And the orange, which is a little bit more exciting in my opinion, shows the uh, power density versus the current density. And from this uh, result, we were able to generate about 100 liters per minute of syngas rich exhaust, which allowed the SOFC to produce about 650 milliwatts per square centimeter of power 
Uh, this might not seem like a lot of power. However, you have to remember that this is a singular SOFC and not a stack. So as you increase the area of active fuel cell, you therefore increase the power generation. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Comer Laboratory, as well as my PI, uh, Dr. Jung and An, as well as ASF for allowing me to present today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, Teddy. Hey, thanks for such a great talk. Um, it's, if I'm understanding correctly, it sounds like you're using a hybrid between regular electric motors with lithium ion batteries and converting using combustion engine from regular fossil fuel fuel cells. So is there some sort of efficiency loss uh, when you convert from the fossil fuel back into the electric? And, you know, is Does that actually end up being a uh, total performance increase in your system? Yeah. Um, so just to quickly clarify, we are planning to replace the lithium polymer battery that is used. So we're starting with the engine and we're going to the solid oxide fuel cell. Uh, so we're completely getting rid of the, the starting with the electric. Of course, um, as you convert from energy types, you know there's going to be some sort of loss. Um, but to get to your last point with the weight, that's why we're going into kind of the medium size we found that the lithium polymer battery, if you're going up for 10 minutes and you're a relatively light uh, UAV, it's going to be more efficient. However, as you get into the bigger size and you want to go out for longer, you want to survey for an hour, for example, the the liquid fuel is going to eventually win out and be more weight efficient. Uh, so we don't have the full system kind of generator right now, the the full attached to the UAV, obviously we need packaging and, and all of that. Um, so right now we're just in the, the startup stages and kind of proving that this is a, a thing that we can go forward with. One more quick question. Hi, uh, <clears throat> um, this is super fascinating for me. Um, I'm, I'm a very avid like drone racer um, and like looking at the system, it fascinates me because um, it looks like there can be performance increases for that zero to 50 pound like weight class. Um, but it seems like it could be a lot more dangerous because now you're working with fuel cells. Could you speak more about um, like what type of application specifically um, would would most benefit from, you know, the the benefits from this new type of powertrain system? Yeah, absolutely. Um... So actually, solid oxide fuel cells are just, you know, ceramics, um, so they're not inherently dangerous. However, we found that as the, the fuel cells get hot, obviously, they, they like to run in a, increased temperatures. As they get hot in their, in their operation, we can actually shut down the engine and just route liquid fuel straight to the SOFC uh, for an engine out application, which is really important for something like a military application where either your engine fails, you know, unexpectedly, or you want to operate more silently. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. You so Very much. interesting. <laughs> All right, to set your expectations, we're going to have one more presentation, and then we're going to take just a few minutes of a stretch break. So I want to welcome Nathan Ferris, and he's from this place called the University of Minnesota. Um, since I lived there, Welcome. Hi. I'm happy to have you. I, I've had a problem with the mics where I get too close and they start screaming. So I'm going to stay a nice distance away. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Go for it. Hello. My name is Nathan Ferris. I'm a senior undergraduate researcher at the University of Minnesota. And today I want to talk to you about particles that are really high in the air. Um, or more specifically, I want to talk about a research collaboration between the University of Minnesota, Andrew Ritter Aeronautical University, and University of Colorado Boulder to do, well, a lot of things, but in part, modify and calibrate low cost optical particle counters for stratospheric use. Now I know you're wondering, why do I care about modifying and calibrating low cost optical particle counters for stratospheric use? Uh, well, it's easy to see why you wouldn't, but it's very important to know that this sort of research has long applications for places outside of what you normally expect. According to Dr. Grant Kamler, a uh, um, world-class hypersonics researcher at the University of Minnesota who I'm working with, uh, these, uh, these small particles have major impacts on hypersonic vehicles. So for instance, spacecraft are turning uh, from space or even going up into space. Uh, what happens is 
the airflow over these systems goes from a nice, smooth, predictable laminar flow to a turbulent flow, which is often called a hot mess. Uh, it makes it really hard to predict what's going on. It makes it substantially more dangerous. If we could predict and understand how these flows uh, move from laminar to turbulent flow, it might be able to make safer, more reliable vehicles. Now, in order to do that, oh man, there's so many green buttons. Uh, in order to do that, we have to be able to modify these systems. The best way to count, or uh, rather, we have to be able to count these particles. The best way to do that is using something called an optical particle counter or an OPC. In a grand scheme, how an OPC works is by running laser light across a flow of air. And then the laser hits particles and scatters and using a lot of fancy math I don't understand, you can count the number of particles that are actually in the system as a whole. Now, uh, it's really hard to do this in an, an atmosphere like the stratosphere where there's not a lot of air and not a lot of particles. However, systems have been designed to do that, such as the light optical aerosol counter or the LOAC. This was designed and built by the French as a way to count these particles, and they found that there are small par particles of atomicron between 30 and 33 kilometers. This is good. However, in order to get the maps that we're looking for, we can't have a unit that costs ten dollars to $15,000 per system. Uh, especially in situations where we might be losing these systems, we need to be able to find ways to get reliable data cheaper. And that's where, fundamentally, our challenge is. How can we design accurate, low-cost systems in order to get a lot of data very quickly from a large region? Uh, and there are a lot of other smaller optical particle counters that exist. However, these are made for uses in things like HVAC and pollution and other uh, things like clean rooms. Uh, this relies on the fact that there's a lot of air and a lot of particles. When you remove the air and the particles, these systems get understandably mad. And that's because the way that these generate their airflow is using small fans. These small fans allow you to move air when it's abundant, but when you move into the stratosphere, they don't really work that well. In fact, most of these systems end up making up their data and it's complete garbage. However, one system, the AlphaSense N3, does not do that. When we modify these systems with artificial ways to get more airflow, such as with rotary vane pumps or something called a centrifugal blower, which can provide the same, uh, or it can provide an order of magnitude more airflow for the same size, weight, and power requirements as a conventional fan, we can actually generate that data. And we found uh, with simple modifications like you can see here, we can develop a system for around $500 as opposed to $15,000. This is two orders of magnitude of cost saving and can allow us to get a lot cheaper systems up in the air and integrated with other systems designed to other universities to get a better profile of the stratospheric air. Um, and we know that the data that we're collecting is at least somewhat reasonable due to initial comparisons of the LOAC and also data like this. This was data taken on July 15, 2021, uh, right when there were Canadian wildfires blowing lots of smoke into Minnesota. And in fact, we can actually see that smoke occurring below five kilometers on this graph. You can see there's several orders of magnitude, more particulates, down low than there is up high. This is good. It shows that our data is at least somewhat real. However, we need to make sure that this data can be accurate. And this involves us having to calibrate these systems. No one's ever taken these low cost systems and yeeted them into space. And so we need to find a better way to actually understand how these systems work. And that involves creating a novel calibration method. We have a way to standardly calibrate these right now uh, by taking a bunch of particles of a known size and passing them to both the reference instrument and to the low cost particle counter and comparing. However, we need to take this up a few notches and introduce a vacuum chamber. This vacuum chamber simulates a uh, high altitude balloon flight, which is what we use as a stratospheric measurement uh, board. Uh, so essentially what we do is we add a vacuum chamber that has uh, temperatures and pressures similar to the stratosphere at speed, similar to the way a balloon would go up or down through the system. Um, and so then we can pass these known particles to a reference instrument and then using a bunch of fancy simulations and math, we can also know how many particles we'd expect at the actual OPC. And so far, our calibrations seem to be working. We're still underway and we're still trying to understand these, but hopefully with continued effort, we'll be able to not only have these systems that can collect data, but be able to collect data accurately and a large scale. And so our next steps are working on uh, making these systems accurate and being able to go at that large scale. I'd like to thank uh, the teams at uh, Colorado Boulder and Riddle Aeronautical University, as well as the ballooning team, Dr. Flotten and Dr. Candler at the University of Minnesota for their help in this project. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Very nice. First question. Great talk, Nathan. So when I picture a central fugal blower, I imagine something that spins to move air, which is just a fan. So what's the difference between a centrifugal blower and a fan? <laughs> a valid question. Uh, <laughs> fundamentally, it, it is a fan, but the way that the geometry is set up, it allows it to move a lot more air and force a lot more air through the system than a conventional fan that you would expect to see in a in a room or in a hotel or whatever you would expect. Um, I can get into the details. I can show you the pictures. And I can nerd out with you. 
Uh, but fundamentally, it's just the way that the system is set up, the geometry, uh, it allows it to move a lot more air and force a lot more air through the same volume. Hurts. Um, two things. First of all, I want you to remember into the uh, the program. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> Yeah, the hope is um because right now flying any vehicles at hypersonic speeds, which for those of you that don't know is about five times the speed of sound, uh, is incredibly dangerous and unpredictable. Uh, which is especially alarming when the person yesterday was talking about the hypersonics arms race uh, with hypersonic missiles. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope they don't blow up. Uh, and so <laughs> it's really important to be able to predict these systems and to be able to better understand uh, how these vehicles work. And in the future, this could lead to things like hypersonic flight. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about being able to use these new uh, spacecraft or pseudo spacecraft that are being built to bring people across the earth really, really quickly. Well, in order to do that, we need to understand how this hypersonic um, flow is going to work in the stratosphere because otherwise it's going to cause a lot of problems like what we saw in the shuttle program. And the other thing, the shuttle was the first hypersonic vehicle ever to fly. We did not have wind tunnels that could Well, we're trying to avoid anything like that because not having the wind tunnels would really blow. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> let us welcome Grace Robertson from Embry Riddle Aeronautical University with the Eagle Cam. I'm so excited. Welcome. So good morning, everyone. I first would like to say I give myself the award for shortest presentation title. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Grace Robertson. I am a rising senior in aerospace engineering out of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And I work very closely here with the Space Technologies Laboratory. Big green. Big green. So many buttons. So who are we? Um, two years ago. Intuitive Machines came to Embry-Riddle and gave us a challenge. They came to us and said, we need you to be able to take third-person images of our lunar lander upon its descent. Flash forward two years, we ship our payload next week. So our collegiate team will be the first of its kind to land a payload on the moon. And we will also be the first American payload to land on the lunar surface since the Apollo days. So who are we? We work in the Space Technologies Laboratory, primarily partnered with Intuitive Machines, but we also have partners like NASA and the Florida Space Consortium that back us and support us through our endeavors. So what does this mean? Who do, what do we do? We have a variety of different teams supporting this mission. Um, so through our mission planning objectives, we this is where we'd go through our design reviews, plan our logistics, make sure everything's in the right place at the right time. Our electrical systems, they go through our custom designs for our printed circuit boards. They make sure all of our power issues are mitigated and we are properly interfaced from an electrical standpoint between the deployer, the lunar lander, and our payload. Our structures team has been primarily responsible for designing our internal structure, making sure that is sound for our descent to the lunar surface, as well as some thermal analysis on the varying subjects inside of the payload. Through testing, we have our clean room operations on our class 10,000 clean room that I have uh, had primary objective in developing. Uh, test plan writing and data acquisition through a variety of space worthy proving testing through thermal testing, vacuum chamber, drop test and radiation testing on all of our components internal and external. So with our sensors team, that is who is in charge of failure mode planning and data acquisition and test planning for all of our sensor packages, including for our IMU and all, all of our cameras. 
So what's the whole point of this mission? We're here to first and foremost ever third person images of an active lunar landing during its descent and touchdown. We will be establishing Wi-Fi on the moon for the very first time. And we will be the first use of NASA's electrodynamic dust shield on the lunar surface for lunar dust mitigation, which has been an issue with all lunar missions since the original days. As you can see, this is an accurately two scale model of all of the rockets <laughs> and of the mission trajectory. So what's the whole point? We will be taking off um, for our lunar flight in early 2022 from a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket going into orbit, injecting um, and exiting the payload bay of that rocket with the IM-1 lunar lander. We will be carried on a payload bay on that lunar lander through two, or two orbits around the moon and then through the descent. We will be jettisoning, jettisoning from the lunar lander at 30 meters. We will then enter a free fall state until we hit the lunar surface. We will then orient through the use of our inertial measurement unit to understand our primary orientation and then begin to capture our mission objectives. So what does the timeline on this look like? I mentioned that the, in two years ago, the intuitive machines came to us and challenged us. Through that year, we developed our initial mission planning and began our team development and team assignments. This past academic year in 2022, 2021, we went through all of our different space viability testing, like I mentioned with the radiation drop tests and thermal and vacuum chamber. Um, this led to the final procurement of all of our components. And through this summer, we have gone through the assembly of both our test flight models and our final lunar model. Our test flight model got shipped out to Blue Origin this past week. We will be launching with Blue Origin on their next flight. And that will be our test flight to prove our uh, components on a few different, few different options there. And then through this fall semester, we will continue our ground planning and different integration testing on the ground in Houston with Intuitive Machines. And then we will be coming up on our final lunar launch and touchdown here in early 2022. So how are we going to execute all of these tasks? We have a variety of different onboard electrical systems, including an NVIDIA TX2 as our primary computer board, an Elroy carrier for to cover some of our electrical systems, a variety of different um, systems, including our battery module, and then in terms of the sensor package, as I aforementioned, our inertial measurement unit and four different cameras positioned around the outside of the CubeSat so we can accurately capture those images. Uh, it's fully dependent on our orientation. We will still be able to capture um, and complete that mission objective. And then lastly would be that electrodynamic dust shield. Um, once we go through and capture those images and relay over Wi-Fi that data to the lunar lander, we will shut down and then use NASA's EDS system for lunar dust mitigation as the first application and relay that data onto our ground teams down in Houston. So we're looking forward to that. Coming up here um, next year, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Troy Henderson, the principal investigator of the Space Technologies Laboratory, PhD candidates Chris Hayes and Daniel Posada, and recent graduate Andrew Ankeny for all of their support in this endeavor and um, all of their hard work that we've worked and put so far into this. If you have any further information, um, if you'd like to get any more pro uh, project information, the link up there is on the QR code for further investigation on the project and my personal contact information below. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. We'll go with that one. Hi, I was curious to learn more about the electrodynamic dust mitigation system. It sounds very interesting. Do you have anything specifically or just in general? Like, how does it work? Yeah. So it's <laughs> extremely high voltage. You have a glass system um, that pumps a extremely amount of high voltage goes through. You can actually find this on some of NASA's Twitter pages. Um, and you can see testing that we've done in our lab. And once you ac activate that system, you're, it's literally like magic. The dust disappears as you pump that voltage through. Um, so that's been an interesting time and just wonderful to be able to use that application and excited to be able to do that here soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. So exciting. All right. Next, let's welcome Corey Elias from Colorado State University. Lunar dust, apparently a very big topic. 
We should get somebody to clean that. Oh, wait. <laughs> All right, hang on one second. The big green one on the top. The big green one until, but where did the thing go? I know it's doing this thing again. Give us one second, okay? I'm already the problem child. No, you're not. <laughs> the computer is the problem child. There we go. There you go. Awesome, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Corey Elias. I am an incoming senior at Colorado State University studying electrical engineering. Today I'd like to share you my personal motto or mantra, whatever you want to call it. It's the statement that I always start any scholarship application essay, Twitter post, Facebook post, whatever. Um, but I thought it might resonate with all of you here today. Amidst all strife in our country and between the countries of our world, one common thread holds humankind together, science. Those who look toward the future are tomorrow's true leaders. You are tomorrow's true leaders. And I am so honored to be here in front of you and share the small amount of research that I've been able to contribute to this incredible industry. Did you know that every astronaut returned from the moon with lung damage? Lunar dust is an extremely toxic substance that causes lung toxicity in the same way that coal miners experience perforation in their lungs um, after spending time in the mining shafts. Lunar dust has incredibly interesting properties. It has electrostatic properties. Depending on what side of the moon it's located, the light side or the dark side, it's either positively or negatively charged. It's also coated in a nanophase iron patina. And this nanophase iron is also contained in the inherent construction of lunar dust based on interactions, micrometeorite interactions with the moon um, over the four billion years that our universe has existed. So these properties, because we're looking at particles that are basically suspended in vacuum um, and are on the order of 10 to 75 micrometers in size, are actually to the point where their magnetic susceptibility is something that can be harnessed for attraction purposes. And as Grace mentioned earlier with the electrodynamic dust shield system, we're able to actually use its electrostatic properties to electrodynamically repel it as well. When Alan Bean returned from the Apollo 12 mission in his technical debrief, he said, we got a lot of dust on ourselves. If it does turn out to be a problem, we're gonna have to come up with some sort of solution. And that's exactly what we did. Cue the space Swiffer. This is not trademarked. Please don't sue me, Swiffer. I promise I'll talk to you eventually. <laughs> The Space Swiffer is a novel handheld electrodynamic lunar dust mitigation device that is designed for astronauts to be able to take on the future Artemis missions and protect themselves from the harmful effects of lunar dust. As we've stated earlier, it's so small, basically just microscopic shards of glass that can get into absolutely anything and on anything. And right now, the current state of the art protects us um, in terms of flat surfaces, solar panels, and even the spider system developed by Boeing, which is actually um, integrated into spacesuits. But there are so many other small nooks and crannies and crevices that we'll be experiencing as we start to develop the moon, establish habitations, and bring people hopefully to colonize that surface. Our device is designed to protect them um, and clean up. The other aspect of lunar dust I mentioned is its magnetic susceptibility. So one of the research projects I've been working on this summer at Colorado State University, um, actually over this year, not this summer, has been to basically design a magnetic characterization test bed that allows us to um, take toroidal magnetic samples and put them through basically a series of high frequency pulse magnetization fluxes and create graphs out of that raw data. So primary current and secondary voltage create data out of that, such as hysteresis loops, extract remnants and coercivity parameters of those magnetic materials. The work I did was specifically to build this graphical user interface, which lets us actually generate graphs. And so this is not directly related to lunar dust, but the work that I was able to do allows me to understand what parameters I'm actually able to identify um, and try to use to harness the potential magnetic, magnetic effects of lunar dust. This is where things get a little bit interesting. I'm gonna share a shocking statistic with you all today that I think is relevant to everyone in this room. It definitely scared me when I learned about it three months ago during my internship at Lockheed Martin. Um, and hopefully it kind of scares a few of you, calls us all to a little bit of action here. There will be a deficit of over 1 million aerospace jobs in the next 10 years. We just don't have enough people. And 
being here and hearing from all the incredible work that you've done, I realize how much potential is in just this room. But there's potential outside of here too. I'm a non-traditional student. I spent four years at a community college and all I knew was I liked science fiction and I liked looking at the stars. I didn't think I would ever be here talking to you all today. There is so much light in this universe that we don't even know about until we start to reach that kind of untapped potential, that dark side of the moon, if you will. So I learned this this summer and all I can say is that has inspired me to continue pursuing outreach. Outreach is part of research, it really is. Understanding the workforce that we're in, learning how to harness the power of people and the passion that people have, even though they may not come from a traditional route or four-year university. So what I did was I helped set up concentrations at Colorado State in the fields of electrical engineering, computer engineering, computer science, on and on to help people get that experience and that exposure the same way I did. The projects I've done were all self-proposed and came from my own reading into NASA's technology taxonomy looking for pain points that NASA needed answers to. And by all of you with your incredible experience and the opportunities that you've made or have been given, if you just spend five seconds of your day posting about something on social media, inspiring that next person to say, you know what, I could do that. I can reach out to that person and I can be like them. That's, I think, on all of us to really take advantage of the social media aspect that we get a lot of crap on, you know, for our generation, <laughs> but to take that and, and turn it into something good and to not only bridge that 1 million deficit, but to make it 5 million, 10 million, make this the biggest industry that we possibly can. So thank you all so much for your time at Astra. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. I'd like to thank my research professor and advisor, Dr. James Kale at Colorado State, as well as Sherry klug Boonstra and Dan Garcia from the L Space Academy who gave me a foothold in this industry. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. All right, very good. Okay. We have time for one question. Do you know how uh, the astronauts um, Get, get lung damage if they're wearing a like a spacesuit, which I assume is like fully enclosed. Right, so it is actually, so it's on the order where it can actually get into and on certain parts. So when um, astronauts were coming back, the lunar dust got all over the command module and it was literally everywhere. It's just like this black powder and I actually have some lunar dust simulant, which I wish I would have brought, but it just looks like soot, to be honest with you. That's how small it is. And it's pervasive and it can get through ventilation. It can get through small cracks in suits. Um, and although we've been very adamant at protecting our astronauts to the extent that we can there are definitely there's a lot of room to to make this better um, so all I can say is it's just it's really 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 small very fine particles and, and very dangerous something we are all I think taking a lot more seriously in, in these years very good thank you so much I might be obsessed with the space swiffer maybe all right Carter Wu from the University of Washington, Alternative Space Launch with RAM Accelerators. Welcome, Carter. All right, so my name is Carter Wu, and while they get this up, oh, there we go. Uh, I'd like to tell you about Alternative Space Launch with RAM Accelerators. I'm here from the University of Washington RAM Accelerator Lab. I'm partnered with Hypersciences in Industry and the NASA Washington Space Grant Consortium. So in order to talk about alternative space launch technologies, we first got to talk about conventional space launch technologies. And there are three main types. We've got rockets, we've got uh, air breathing, and we've got guns. And the primary difference between these is the amount of stuff that they have to carry. So with rockets, we carry our propellant, we carry our oxidizer, we carry our engine, we blow it up, we send it out the back, we get thrust. Air breathing, we carry uh, only our propellant and our engine. We mix it with the air that's coming in. We blow it out the back. We combust it. We produce thrust. Guns, we carry a single charge at the very start. We detonate our charge. We send a projectile flying down the tube, do this pressure, uh, pressure wave. We get thrust. Now, the great thing about all of these as we go down the list is that we get a higher and higher payload fraction as we go down. We have to carry less and less. And with guns, you can think about them as having 100% payload fraction as compared to something like the space shuttle, which is, I think, 6.5%. Um, so really, we want to take advantage of these different technologies whenever we can. This is why we don't use rockets in atmosphere for commercial transport, for instance. 
Um, so one of the things that we can do in order to take advantage of this high payload fraction is we can combine these technologies. In uh, NASA rockets, we take, sometimes we put ramjets on rockets for the atmospheric stages. We can put rockets in guns and combine these technologies and shoot rockets out of guns. Think Project HARP, High Altitude Research Project, take you back to the 1960s, super guns. These are 176 foot long, 120 millimeters. They shoot rockets into space out of guns. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the originator. So that's where we're going today, people. Can I? Oh, there we go. Oh. Now, there are some fundamental problems with guns. We start out <laughs> by the fact that there is combustion only at the breach. We have a single charge that detonates. We send a projectile down the tube. We get massive wave fall off. The projectile, uh, the pressure falls off as we travel down the tube, and our acceleration profile is defined for us. We can't control our acceleration profile, and the only way to scale up our muzzle velocity is by increasing that initial explosive size. And at some point, there is a limit to how far we can go with explosive size. If we want to send something to the moon, we can't detonate a nuke every time. Uh, we got to think a little differently if we want to use guns to send something to space. And so the technology that we've come up with is the ram accelerator, where instead of having this single charge, we have combustion throughout the entire tube. We fill the tube with fuel and oxidizer, and we create a combustion wave that stands at the very base of the projectile and sends that thing flying forward. If we can control the wave velocity, we can match it with the projectile. We can ride this thing like a surfboard um, and get thrust. Now, the great thing about this is not only can we control the, com the chemistry at each point into the tube con to control the heat release and to, and to control the thrust, we get scalable system. So we can scale the entire velocity of this system with tube length. So instead of scaling with explosive size, we scale with tube length. You want to go faster, add another five meters of tube. Now, of course, you don't get this for free. How does we actually create this combustion wave standing at the very back of this thing? It's an engine, right? It just doesn't look like an engine. Um, it's a projectile flying down a tube, but it really is an engine, uh, if you'll stick with me. We have the same thing that we do in an engine. We have an intake, we have compression, we have combustion, we have expansion, we have exhaust. And this happens because we're operating as a ramjet, an in-tube ramjet that's flying down a tube. We just don't carry any propellant, we don't carry any oxidizer, and the engine is the projectile itself, right? And so we don't have to carry anything with us. The ram accelerator is a supersonic technology. So we start in, we launch from, say, a light gas gun at Mach 2 in the uh, mixture that we're working in. And the fuel and oxidizer is coming out of supersonically. We get an oblique shockwave that compresses for us. It's our compression cycle right there at the front. We go over the projectile. The flow follows all the way back to that normal shock standing at the back. We get more compression. We go to the very base of the projectile where the flow is expanding. It sees an increase in area. And we get to the very base where the flow comes to fill the space at, that is being evacuated by the base of the projectile. And we get, because of that dramatic air, increase in area, we get combustion standing right at the base of the projectile, right where we want it. It's like a rocket, but you don't have to carry anything with you, right? You get all of this thrust for free in terms of payload. Now, the applications of ram accelerators are very diverse. Um, we've got a system that operates between 0 0.7 and 10 kilometers a second, so Mach 2 to 30. Now, I in lab, I remember I said that we scale with tube length, right? We scale our velocity with tube length. In our lab, we have eight meters of tube compared to you know however long you can get it for an actual application. We have eight meters of tube, we get to 2.7 kilometers a second. Now, for something like this, we can use it for ICBMs and single stage to orbit because we can get these high speeds, but because we also have this fine tunable acceleration profile that we can control dynamically, we can do sensitive electronics, we can do small satellites, we can do resupply missions for fuel, for uh, biologicals, for anything we want to send to the space. And because the turnaround time on a ram accelerator is on the order of minutes, we can send 2,000 kilograms to space every couple minutes. That's a pretty good deal. Now, the great thing about this, it reduces payload fraction. Uh, so something like this, this rocket here that uh, was drawn up, you shoot it out of a ram accelerator, you get a rocket in space uh, without having to burn any launch stages. This thing has 30 to 40% payload fraction. Um, which is fantastic. So you have all of these various applications, you have a higher mass uh, to orbit, and you get more done by using a ram accelerator. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have time for two, let's try two questions. Let's go with this question here first. Oh, sorry. 
All right, well, we'll go with that question first. Uh, you might have mentioned it, um, but how would you um, get this um, actual payload started in the beginning? Um, would you just combine technology? Because I know with ramjets, you actually need to be moving quite yeah. fast. Yeah, so right now for our lab, we use a light gas gun. Um, there's really a variety of different options, but we're currently working on low velocity start. So right now we start at 0.7 kilometers a second. We're working to get that down to maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.4 kilometers a second so that we can use more efficient technologies to really get that initial boost of momentum and start using the more efficient ram accelerator. Um, so we're getting that velocity down so we can use more and more different technologies there. Great, thank you. One more question. So ram accelerators and uh, like single stage to orbit things cause a lot of G forces on the payload. Sure. Uh, what sort of G-forces are we talking about here? And how do you protect sensitive payloads from being absolutely crushed? Yeah. So I said that we have full acceleration profile, uh, full control over the acceleration profile all the way down the tube. So if you want a low acceleration, you just make, you add in a dillion, you change your fuel to oxidizer ratio, you can get a less reactive flow, right, at throughout the tube, right? And so if you have a less, if you have less thrust throughout the entire tube, you make the tube very long, very low thrust, right? With a very, uh, very fuel rich mixture. And so you get very uh, low thrust over a very long period of time. I think one of the initial proposals was to wind a massive ram accelerator all the way around a mountain. Um, take that as you will, but you can launch people into space uh, with a really, really long, long uh, ram accelerator to launch sensitive projectiles. All right, well, thank you so much. All right, thank you everyone. Well done. All right, next we want to welcome Spencer Hurt from the University of Colorado. Uh, I'm sorry, no, yeah, University of Colorado Boulder. I love the presentation title. It's not quite what I have on my sheet, but I like Hidden Worlds, very intriguing. So go ahead and get started when you're ready. The, the, yep, that goes forward. Welcome. Thank you so much. The number of known exoplanets has exponentially grown in the last 30 years. In fact, we see that this number doubles nearly every 27 months, meaning that today we have about 4,500 known planets out of our solar system. However, astronomers estimate that there should be around 100 billion exoplanets in our galaxy alone. And if you're impatient like me, this begs the question, why haven't we found more? Well, let us, the answer lies within observational biases. Let us look at the radial velocity detection method as an example. If you have a planet orbiting around your star, it exerts a gravitational force that causes that star to enter its very own mini orbit. And as the star orbits and moves back and forth with respect to an observer, its light is going to become Doppler shifted. So over time, it's periodically going to become more blue and more red. And if we track the changes in this light, we can determine the motion of the star. And if there's periodic variability in that motion, we can infer the presence of a planet. However, this method is largely dependent on the geometry of a system and the observer. For example, if we take a look at the observer on the, my left, on your guys' right, uh, you see that they're viewing the orbit face on. And as a consequence, the star is only moving side to side in their frame of reference. It's not moving back and forth. And as a consequence, there is no Doppler shifting to be seen, and the planet is rendered invisible. Additionally, we see a lot of problems coming up with the star itself. For example, if there's a surface feature like a star spot or a plage rotating in and out of view, it can create a signal in our radial velocities that looks a lot like an exoplanet. And lastly, we see that mass input or orbital position of the planet also matter quite a bit. Just looking at Newton's law of gravitation, we see that the more massive an object is, or the closer it is to its star, the greater the gravitational force, and as a consequence, the more obvious the motion of the star. If we look at the uh, distribution of the parameters for the known exoplanet population, it becomes quite apparent how mass and orbital radius matter when trying to detect these objects. Specifically, only the lowest mass planets are found incredibly close to their stars. So how can we push our detection limits so that we can try to find planets that are similar to Earth, or maybe even smaller, terrestrial-sized planets? Well, there are a couple of different strategies. First off, we probably should look towards better and better instrumentation. 
Modern spectrographs are able to measure the motion of a star down to about one meter per second, which is incredibly impressive, but we really need something closer to a couple centimeters per second to detect a lot of these lower mass planets. Um, while we're waiting for this better instrumentation, we can use strategic observing. For example, if we choose close by targets that are relatively bright, we can have high signal to noise observations that already increase our precision. Along with that, we need to look at stars uh, for very long times at high cadence. This can improve our ability to detect periodic signals with very low amplitudes. And lastly, we need to be smart about how we model our data, how we search for periodic signals in them, especially in trying to account for these complex phenomena such as star spots. There are two different objects I'd like to take a look at to illustrate how these methodologies can push our detection limits and our sensitivity, the first of which is Vega. Vega is an incredibly well-known star because it's one of the brightest in our night sky, and it was also featured in Carl Sagan's book and movie, Contact. A lot of people have looked for planets around Vega, but they haven't really used any methods that are sensitive to objects in the inner system. Uh, we, my group, however, had been gathering radial velocities for the past decade uh, at a relatively high cadence. And so when we search this data for any periodic signals, we immediately see this really strong signal located near two thirds of a day, which happens to be Vega's rotation period. Now, this indicates that Vega has star spots, some sort of surface feature which is surprising because first off, Vega is an A-type star and should be too hot to have magnetic field and shouldn't have star spots in the first place, meaning there's some problem with our understanding of stellar physics. But besides that, back to exoplanets, <laughs> uh, when we account for this rotational modulation in our data, we see a new signal emerge at about 2.43 days that would correspond to a candidate hot Neptune or hot Jupiter. I say hot because this planet could have a temperature of about 3,500 Kelvin, which is hotter than a lot of stars. Additionally, we're able to place detection limits in objects in this inner system, and we're actually able to rule out objects with masses lower than Jupiter. Uh, this may not sound very impressive when I'm talking about searching for terrestrial planets, but Vega is quite larger than most of the objects we're searching for planets around, so this does represent an improvement in our detection limits for objects like A-type stars. Lastly, I'd like to take a look at Gliese 411, which happens to be the fourth closest stellar system to ours. Uh, looking at about 15 years of archival data, we identify three different periodic signals, the first of which uh, occurs every 13 days and is a previously known exoplanet, the second of which is a 3,000-day signal that was previously disputed as either a planet or as a long-term magnetic activity cycle. We verify that it corresponds to a planet. And then lastly, we identify a candidate super-Earth on a 215-day orbit. All these signals are incredibly low amplitude and represent some of the best detections made using these instruments. If we look at how their masses compare to other objects at their various orbital radii, we see they're located on that detection floor. Uh, exoplanet science is entering this fascinating era that is more focused on characterization than detection, so looking for things such as atmospheric signatures and structures or even habitability. However, as long as we're only characterizing objects that are larger than Earth that don't look like our terrestrial planets, we're never going to have a complete picture of habitability, or we're never going to have a complete picture of things like planet formation or planet evolution. So it's important we fill these observational gaps. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Well done. All right, we have time. Let's go with this gentleman right here. Do we have the microphone? Sorry, Dan. I am making you walk today. Get your steps in. Get my steps in for me, please. So I don't know what your observational cadence was for Vega, but is it? Are you, are you sampling that in a truly periodic way, such that you can actually like do a discrete Fourier transform on it? Or are you doing power spectral fitting, or how are, how are you handling that data to? Yeah, so systems. kind of the common recipe for searching for signals in uh, radial velocity data is do something called a periodogram, which simply shows like at a period of this length of time. Uh, is there, it's basically like how good is the chi-squared fitting, something kind of like that. Um, and so that's how we identify all the individual signals in there. Um, you do really run into a lot of things, like a lot of people who work with signal analysis, like we do have to take into consideration the Nyquist frequency, whether or not they're harmonics of a signal and so on. I would love to say we have time for more questions, but we're out of time, but that was fascinating. And, and please um, take some time to chat more about your questions later. So. Thank you, well done, well done. So next, let's welcome Brooke Horsch, Harsh from 
the Florida Institute of Technology. We're gonna talk about the analysis of OSIRIS-REx NAVCAM-1 image anomalies at Bennu. This sounds like a science fiction movie. Awesome. First. <laughs> Sorry. That's all good. All right, so first, a little disclaimer. <laughs> Uh, in order to get this approved on time, I had to use a presentation from over a year ago. Since then, we've gone through a lot more optimization and thresholding. So actually, the data looks even better than it does in this presentation. And I'll point out where there's some of those differences. So now, onto the presentation. How would you guys like to see something? Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's directly from the mission operations room at OSIRIS-REx. Yes. This is a little model of Bennu, that asteroid right there which has the double added bonus of being a little stressful. So you'll see me holding that this time. <laughs> so I've spent the last three summers, uh, directly after my freshman year of college, working with the optics branch with the Cyrus-Rex mission at NASA Goddard, looking at image anomalies in NAVCAM-1 at Bennu. Which button is forward? The big green one. Green one, okay. <laughs> So a bit of background about OSIRIS-REx. OSIRIS-REx is an asteroid sample return mission launched by NASA on September 8, 2017. You can see a picture of it over on the right. Its objectives were to travel to the near-Earth asteroid Bennu, survey and map its surface, as you can see here, and then obtain at least 60 grams of surface material. It successfully completed this tag last year and is now already on its way back to Earth, where it'll arrive in 2023. So on OSIRIS-REx, there's this instrument called TACAM. So it's a three-headed uh, camera system, and its primary instrument is NAVCAM-1. This, is, this camera was taking pictures of Bennu as OSIRIS-REx is approaching in order to support optical navigation. Now, in some of these images, you would notice there's these streaks that are occurring that aren't real. They're occurring in single image frames. And this is really common when you have a detector in space. There's so much radiation that's constantly bombarding these detectors and it shows up as these single frame anomalies. However, on January 6, 2019, as OSIRIS-REx began orbiting Bennu for the first time, NAVCAM-1 started observing image anomalies that were occurring over multiple image frames, which means it can't be radiation related because those are instantaneous events. And so after looking into it, the science team eventually just realized that these had to be real particles, real objects being ejected from the surface of Bennu. So this was really exciting because it reclassified Bennu as one of only a few known active asteroids in our solar system. So my mentor, Brent Boss, decided that it was necessary to create a catalog of all known anomalies that we were seeing in these images, both radiation related and particles in order to try and identify more particles, which we couldn't confirm because they were occurring in single image frames. Again, single image frames are radiation related typically, but we might have been seeing particles only in the single images, so they were unable to be confirmed. This is a typical image I would have looked at. The first two summers I spent with the uh, mission were spent creating this catalog. There's a big catalog, and this is the standard type of image I would be looking at little by little throughout the entire thing. And Bennu is right there in the corner. And in this image, you see both a cosmic ray on the left and a little particle down in the right. And you're gonna see those close up in the next couple slides. First, we'll talk about the radiation artifacts. And there's a lot of different ways that these would show up on our detector in our images. But the one I'll primarily talk about is the streak ones, which is right over there on the right, which I'm gonna to refer to as cosmic rays from now on. So cosmic rays are radiation-induced events primarily caused by the high-speed impact of a proton or hydrogen atom nucleus. And after go going through and making the catalog, as well as with the help of a dark pixel region on the detector, we were able to determine that these cosmic rays are typically described as a streak with a varying width and or brightness. There were some other shapes, but particularly for our analysis later, we wanted to focus on the ones that looked like streaks. And these make up the vast majority of our catalog. Um, but actually including all the other radiation-related events, it's about 70%. So these are really, really common. There we go. So the really exciting type of anomaly is the particles, the real objects being ejected from Bennu's surface. And through finding 356 confirmed particles occurring over multiple images, we were able to determine that these particles had a very consistent set of characteristics. They were always had a very consistent brightness along the streak and a very consistent width. And uh, interestingly, they had a lot of varying sizes, which was most likely dependent on the speed and angle at which they were approaching the detector. 
And, oh, and they make up a very small amount of anomalies. Like I said, cosmic rays uh, and radiation events account for 70%. Particles only account for about 16%. So as of June 12, 2020, and we started observing these taking images in October 2018, we found 2,148 total anomalies out of 26,000 images. So that's a lot to look through. And so of these, again, 356 streaks are confirmed particles. 344, we do not know their source. This is almost double the amount of particles. So if we're, these are basically anomalies which look like particles, but we can't confirm they are because they occur in a single image frame. So we determined that we would needed to try and create an image metric that would be able to determine, be able to assign a probability to these streaks in order to decide what is the likelihood that they are a particle or a cosmic ray. And we've successfully created two of these metrics, which are pretty accurate. So in no particular order, the first metric we created takes the DN value, or it's a bright, measure of brightness, of every pixel in a streak and then divides it by the maximum DN value. And then we also take the standard deviation of those values. So again, for particles, you expect there to be very little variation. So you expect the standard deviation to be lower. And this is represented in our data. And again, this looks even better after further optimization thresholding. The particles are on the left, the darker region, whereas in very, very tight distribution compared to the cosmic rays, which have a much larger spread. And then for metric two, this metric takes the fifth highest pixel DN and divides it by the maximum. So what we were seeing as we were looking through these, uh, there could be a very tight region of, part of, of pixel values in the cosmic ray hits that were fairly close, but the fifth value was where it typically tended to drop off significantly. And we wanted to be able to analyze as many um, anomalies in this metric as possible. So to maximize the number, that we could, we chose five. That way it was only those who are under five pixels in length that would not be considered by this metric. And so particle, for particles, this value is expected to be close to one. And this is the graph that looks significantly better after optimization and some debugging because we almost doubled the population size that can be represented in this graph. So to conclude, as I said, these metrics allow us to estimate the probability of a, anom a single frame anomaly or any anomaly of being caused by a real object or a radiation artifact. So what's the point of this? Well, NAVCAM-1 is part of the standard ECAM line for mainland space science systems. And there's a lot of upcoming asteroid missions that are going to use detectors from that same line. One of those is the Lucy mission, it's TTCAM. And so when Lucy goes out to the Trojan asteroids, if it happens to find any of these anomalies, we can use these and apply it to find out if maybe there are more active asteroids as it flies by the, I believe, six Trojan asteroids uh, that I'll be examining. And then also there's another proposed mission using OSIRIS-REx again to go to the asteroid Apophis. So again, it's re relevant to that as well. And so looking forward, we have a paper coming out soon about all of this. <laughs> so if you're interested in learning more, please keep an eye out for that. But if you're also interested in more of my work, I have a completely different uh, sort of research in my undergraduate research. And I have three papers coming out about quasi-periodic oscillation and active galactic nuclei. So it's a big jump from this work, <laughs> but that concludes my presentation. Great. So I'd be Thank happy to take so much. From my all right, so do we have Alexandra? Hello, that is me. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Welcome, Alexandra. So we're going to see you coming in from the University of Chicago, investigating the relationship between binary fraction and metallicity in Magell Magellanic clouds. Awesome. Welcome. Okay. Well, let me share my screen. Yes, please. Uh I'm so sorry, technical difficulties. It's all right. Okay. Ready? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can, go ahead. Awesome. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming and for bearing with me as I present virtually. I really wish I could be there with you in person, but I'm currently out of the country for a summer internship. So I really appreciate the ASF making it possible for me to still present virtually. My name is Alexandra Masegan, and I'm a third year student at the University of Chicago studying astrophysics. Today, I'll be telling you about a project I've been doing to investigate the relationship between the binary fraction and metallicity in the Magellanic clouds. So that's a lot of fancy astrophysics terms. Let's break down the title. 
You may know that some stars form in binary systems, which means that they are gravitationally bound to a second star, such that the two stars are orbiting each other around a common center. But what you might not know is that for certain types of stars, binary systems are quite common. We can quantify how common they are with a measurement known as the binary fraction, which is the ratio of stars that form in binary systems to the stars that form on their own for either a given stellar population or a galaxy or anything you want to quantify. For stars like our sun, the binary fraction is about 50%, so almost half of the stars with the same mass of our sun form in binary systems. But for stars more massive than our sun, that number is even higher. Because so many stars form in binary systems, understanding these systems is really important for understanding stellar evolution in general. This is why it's so important to understand how the binary fraction changes depending on certain parameters. In my project, the parameter of interest is metallicity, which characterizes the chemical composition of a star or stellar population. In astronomy, we consider anything heavier than helium to be a metal. Uh, so metallicity measures how abundant those elements are compared to the abundance of hydrogen and helium, like I said, either in one star or in a stellar population. So why are we interested in metallicity specifically? Well, until recently, the relationship between the binary fraction and metallicity was a giant question mark. Some studies had found a positive correlation between the two, some had found a negative correlation, and some had found absolutely no relationship at all. This was problematic because, as I mentioned before, understanding what affects the binary fraction is really important for understanding stellar evolution. After all, stars with different metallicities form in different ways. But until 2019, the effect of metallicity on the binary fraction was unclear. Then in 2019, Mo et al. published this paper in which they reanalyzed the data from five past studies on this topic that originally had conflicting results. And essentially what they did is they accounted for common sources of error within those studies and made them agree on a single conclusion. And that conclusion was that the binary fraction is actually anti-correlated with metallicity. So that's shown in this plot here from their paper. Um, each color here represents one of the, new, the studies that they reanalyzed. And as you can see, there is a clear negative trend between metallicity on the x-axis and the binary fraction on the y-axis. If this relationship is true, this represents a groundbreaking advancement in our understanding of binary evolution. So with all that being said, the goal of my project is to test Mo et al's bold hypothesis by estimating the binary fraction in each of the Magellanic clouds. These are two small irregular galaxies that are very close to the Milky Way, and they are the perfect test bed for this hypothesis for several reasons. First, the Magellanic clouds are at almost the same distance from us here on Earth, which means that it's really easy to compare between them without having to correct for any redshift or anything nasty like that. Second, they are very well studied, which means that we have a comprehensive understanding of their properties. Most importantly, of course, their metallicity. We know that the small Magellanic cloud has a metallicity that's about half of the large Magellanic clouds, which means that if Mo et al's hypothesis is correct, we should see twice as many binaries in the small Magellanic cloud as in the large Magellanic cloud. So it sounds pretty simple. All we need to do is count the number of binaries in each galaxy. How do we do that? Well, the way that we can identify binaries is through their light curves because they happen to have really distinctive light curves. A light curve is a graph of how a star's brightness changes over time, such as the one that's up on the screen right now. For single stars, they usually have constant flat light curves because they shouldn't really vary in brightness too much. But for binary systems, things are a bit more interesting. As the stars are rotating around each other, they occasionally line up in our line of sight, and the light from the star in front will block the light from the star behind. This creates a dip in the light curve, and since the stars are rotating in a periodic way, it will create a regular sequence of dips. So this curve on the screen is actually an example from our data set, from the LMC in particular. Um, you can see time is on the x-axis and brightness is on the y-axis, and those two dips are exactly what we want to see that is characteristic of a binary system. I have light curves like this for about 300,000 stars in each galaxy, though most of them are not binaries. So what we need to do is automatically identify which ones have curves like this so that we can estimate how many binary systems are in each galaxy, which will then allow us to calculate the binary fractions. Now, this has been much more difficult than we originally anticipated. Um, currently, I'm working on building a neural network that I hope will be able to do this automatic classification with over 90% accuracy, but that is still in progress at the moment. So once that classification is complete, I will finally be able to put most hypothesis to the test and see if the binary fraction is in fact anti-correlated with metallicity in the Magellanic clouds. 
Thank you guys very much. I will now take any questions. Thank you. All right, we have time for a couple questions. Yeah, uh, this is a bit curious to me. Are there like any a priori reasons to believe why the uh, metallicity and the binary fraction are anti-correlated with each other? That is a good question. I don't think so. Not to my knowledge. I don't think we had any idea what the relationship would be going into this. And that's why there was so much disagreement about it for such a long time. Okay, cool. One more question. You want to take the one from the back there still? Thank you. Hi. So thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask, you said you're doing a neural network right now. What's your AOC looking like for your rock curve? We have not gotten to that point yet. We're still working on the architecture of it. Um, so I'm sorry, I could not tell you. OK, what architecture are you using? We're building a convolutional neural network. And this is something that I'm very new to. So I'm sorry if I don't fully know the terminology or anything like that. But our thought was that turning the light curve into an image would be would allow the um, neural, neural network to operate on more of the actual shape of it than just feeding in every single data point from the light curve. Sure. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you for coming to. Where are you coming to us from? I'm currently in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, ah, yeah. Heidelberg, sehr schöne Stadt. Yes, it's beautiful here. Yes, it is. Good. <laughs> well, thank you, Alexandra. That was fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Next, we want to welcome our next virtual presenter, Lena Mather from. USC, otherwise known as the University of Southern California. Um, I am terribly interested in this. Machine learning approaches for detecting the social behavior of deception. Lena, tell me more. I need your services. Lena, are you with us? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Hi, so my name is Lena. I'm from USC. And I really wish I could be there with all of you today. Um, but I have a job in LA, which is where I am right now. And um, I am a rising senior. And I'm majoring in computer science, cognitive science, and linguistics. And my research interests are at the intersection of these fields in human-centered artificial intelligence. Today, I'll be talking about my ongoing undergraduate thesis research on machine learning approaches for detecting the social behavior of deception. And this is advised by Professor Maya Matarik from USC's Robotics and Autonomous Systems Center. So to start off, I thought I'd give a broad overview of what the field of human-centered AI is. So advances in traditional artificial intelligence and social signal processing are enabling the emergence of this new field, which develops AI systems that can sense, perceive, and respond to human behavioral and emotional states. So if you picture um, like a robot or machine in front of you, it immediately becomes human-centered as soon as it can perceive your visual behaviors, like your facial expressions, uh, interpret your vocal pitch, look at the semantic content of your speech, and use all of that to better support your well being. My thesis research focuses on developing machine learning models for deception detection. The human ability to, de to de detect deception has been established as close to chance level across uh, virtually every study of the ability. And so that motivates the development of computational approaches that can ideally perceive more subtle behavioral patterns to be able to recognize deception versus truthful behavior. My project is motivated by social good applications because there are definitely some very evil applications of deception detection, but I really care about helping, for example, healthcare and social workers recognize people masking negative experiences, especially because people sometimes um, feel constrained and scared to disclose certain types of experiences. And uh, deception detection can also help legal teams better assess the testimonies of children, often coerced to lie on the stand by adults. Prior machine learning models for detecting deception have leveraged uh, the following four modalities. So the visual modality, vocal modality, verbal modality, and physiological modality. But these prior models have not used continuous affect which can be components of emotions and moods. My research introduces affect as a novel modality for deception detection. Affect is typically modeled along two dimensions. 
valence, which is how positive or negative an emotional state is, and arousal, which is how active or passive an emotional state is. You can see on this diagram that different emotional states can be mapped to this two-dimensional space. I hypothesized that patterns in facial valence and facial arousal could be effectively leveraged to automatically detect deception. And my hypothesis was backed up by psychology theories, which were developed decades ago, the leakage hypothesis for factor theory, which hypothesized that deceivers would be exhibiting affective states with lower valence and higher arousal. This is a quick summary of my key findings from the past year. I used a standard deception data set, which is used in all of the machine learning literature around this challenge. And I observed that facial affect patterns in about 50 speakers in this data set provided computational support for those two existing deception psychology theories, which is exciting because they were theorized like decades ago. Now we can actually prove them with uh, machine learning and so signal processing. I also found that models trained only on the facial affect modality were comparable to the visual and vocal modalities and much better than the traditional verbal modality. And these models that were just trained on facial affect achieved an AUC of 80%. And the highest performing multimodal approach, which used facial affect, visual, and vocal features, achieves an AUC of 91%, which outperforms existing approaches on this challenge. The broad takeaways, um, this research demonstrates that facial affect has potential as a novel modality for deception detection and more broadly for social behavior modeling. That's really the next step I'm gonna be taking this because um, I have a hunch that affect and emotion can be used to predict behaviors in various social situations, and it's currently not being used to do that, and it would be interesting to explore that. My research also demonstrates the value in taking an interdisciplinary approach, in this case, drawing on psychology theories to advance and improve the performance of human-centered AI. And on this slide, I have a couple of publications that came out of this research. One of them, uh, I was fortunate, actually won a Best Paper Award nomination at the top conference in my subfield of computer science. And um, these are other publications from following work um, that came out of this. Thank you. And I'd love to answer any Thank questions. Thank you. There, yeah, I have like a million questions, but why don't we take the one in the backer of the road? No, keep going right there. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to this uh, fascinating research. Um, are you familiar with Dr. Ekman's microexpression study and um, his theories and have you used this in your um, research? And also if yes, and if no, <laughs> what are your thoughts about universality of the, the expressions of deception across different cultures and races? I'm familiar with Ekman and I cited him quite a bit in my, in my papers, but um, he has done quite a bit of work on universality of emotions. I believe he ran the first study ever by going to various cultures around the world. And he found that certain facial expressions appear to be um, universal across cultures. Mm -hmm. However, there, there has been a, a big debate around that. And so there's lots of evidence, for example, that it can change across modalities. So different cultures might recognize universally that a smile is like happiness, but the tone of the voice will change across cultures. And I'm really glad you asked that question because that's actually the topic of my current summer research. I'm doing research at Caltech on modeling emotions across cultures. And we're conducting the first uh, like machine learning approach for doing that. We had another question right there. Hi, what an amazing talk. Um, I have a quite silly question. I wanted to inquire if you have found a um, a greater ability to detect if people are lying in your daily life? Um, well, I am quite a cynical person, so I assume maybe. <laughs> uh, so assume lying if not. But no, um, I don't think, I think in general, I, I'm, I fall with the same population of humans that just have a hard time. And that meta analysis of uh, we've close to 100 studies found that across various social situations, various types of people, uh, people are just really bad at this, and that's why like, we can't really rely on human judgment, but that at the same time, we shouldn't rely on AI only. Like, should be a, like humans and AI should work together um, mm -hmm. for this problem. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. We are out of time, but before you go, Lena, first of all, fascinating. Second of all, 
one of these days, give me a call because I want to talk ethics with you. Yeah, definitely. So thank you. Very thank you interesting. So thank you so much. All right. Next, we want to welcome Jay Miguel from Tufts University. Welcome. We're going to talk about weight bearing C arm cone beam CT imaging of the knee using a dynamic range transducer. Yes, I've had my coffee. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Miguel Fontesella, and I will be presenting on weight bearing C arm cone beam computer tomography imaging of the knee uh, using a dynamic range reducer. And I was able to perform this uh, research at Stanford University under the guidance of Dr. Adam Wong. And so starting off with some background information regarding the motivation for my project, osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease that is characterized by the degradation of the joint's cartilage and the underlying bone. And so osteoarthritis is the leading cause of aging related functional decline in adults. 49.3 million adults are impacted on an annual basis, and this leads to an annual cost of $186 billion. And so various imaging techniques are used to assist in the diagnosis process of osteoarthritis, one of which is x-ray imaging. And x-ray imaging is used to visualize the cartilage loss between um, healthy and arthritic knees. And so uh, x-ray imaging is limited in the amount of soft de tissue detail that it is able to provide. So in the context of the knee, this refers to the cartilage itself. And so one of the great benefits of x-ray imaging, however, is that it's able to provide imaging during uh, the weight-bearing position. So in other words, while patients are in a standing position. And so we decided to utilize cone beam computer tomography for our project. And so this is a computerized form of x-ray imaging. And specifically, we decided to use the Siemens Artis Zigo C-Arm. And so can we press play on this video? Mm -hmm. Press play. Which one's play? So if not, that's okay. But essentially what this mechanism is able to do is that it's able oh, to- Oh, look, there we go. Oh, great. So essentially what this mechanism is able to do is it's able to rotate around the patient at 200 degrees in order to obtain images of the knee at various positions. So each of these positions is referred to as an individual image frame. And so there are some challenges with cone beam computer tomography, one of which is that there is a large scale dynamic range which saturates the peripheral regions of these x-ray images. So we can observe this here. Um, so here we are observing the uh, outline of the knee as well as the physiology. And then we are also seeing the peripheral regions are um, containing excess flux. And so essentially what we're seeing here is that broadly speaking, we're seeing that the outer regions of the image are much brighter than the knee itself. And so this is resulting in inferior knee image quality itself, which is affecting the diagnosis process using these images. And so in previous studies, attending materials known as beam blockers, or um, they are consisting of plasticine, have been used in order to reduce this uh, excess flux on these peripheral regions. So essentially what this meant was that they wrapped these beam blockers around the entirety of the patient's knee, but this is not particularly ideal as this may modify the knee's kinematics, which is in particularly important to avoid in this context. And so as an alternative, the Stanford Wong Laboratory developed DIRAR, which is a prototype which consists of eight individual brass wedges. So as we can observe here, each lateral side contains four individual brass wedges, which are connected to separate motors, which are pre-programmed to conform to either the model-specific or the patient-specific knee shape. And so we can see this in application on this slide, where we're observing a conventional image here, where again, we're observing that excess flux in those peripheral regions and then the knee in the center of the image. And then in the center image, we are seeing the application of the DIRA itself. So essentially what this is showing us is that we are seeing um, essentially the projection of the shadow of each of these individual brass wedges. So what this is doing is that this is reducing the flux of those pixels that are at risk of being excessively saturated. And so here we are observing on this rightmost image the application of both of these. So we are observing a 20-fold reduction in the dynamic range using the styro system. And we're seeing this is improving um, the quality of this knee uh, x-ray image itself. And so here um, we are looking at the two aspects of DIRAR itself. So on this side, we are seeing the wedges moving out and the back in. So this is being referred to as our calibration scan and being referred to as forward and reverse motion as they move out and in respectively. 
And then here we were observing the dyewear tracking scan. So these wedges are continuously moving to follow the outline of the knee in order to attenuate again that excess flux that we're seeing in the peripheral regions. And so what we would like to note here is that we will be uh, using the calibration scan for this next step. But what is important to note is that this is still a prototype in the sense that we are observing a difference between the position that we are commanding for the wedges to be in versus where they're actually in during the uh, imaging itself. And so because of this, this may lead to some differences in the image quality that we are observing. And so we want to determine if we're observing any particular trends in this difference or if there was a difference at all between the commanded from our programming position versus that of the actual position during the imaging um, itself. And so how we did this was that we uh, essentially ran this calibration scan a total of 13 times to have 13 different data sets. And since ideally these data sets would be relatively similar, we wanted to determine if there was any differences in the trends. So as these um, wedges are shown here, they were numbered one through four and then five through eight. And so what we observed was that the central wedges showed a limited uh, variation across these data sets. So across all these data sets, we didn't see the positional error change very much. We observed for grouping or clustering in um, the bottom wedges of four and eight, as we observed for two distinct groups to form. And then we observed in wedges number one and five for there to be more variation across uh, each of the different data sets. So we saw that for forward and reverse motion for wedge number one, and then strictly for reverse motion in wedge number five. So we observed a uh, similar uh, analysis in the standard deviation. As we were observing in the central wedges, the standard deviation was the lowest, whereas in those top wedges, we were observing for the standard deviation to be the highest. And so what this was doing was that it allowed for us to identify positional errors and trends in these positional errors by each individual wedge. So again, these central, these bottom, and these top wedge groups. And so um, for future steps, we may instead revert from this calibration scan solely to now the tracking scan. So while those wedges are following the knee itself during that imaging process. And in doing so, we may improve the image quality um, of these x-rays of the knee in order to assist physicians in diagnosing osteoarthritis as a condition in their patients. And so I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Adam Wong for his mentorship in this project, um, to the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation for their professional support. And I would just like to uh, take this time to also encourage all the black and brown youth who may be watching to continue to apply for institutions such as Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Not only are you extremely talented, but you are so necessary for the progression of our future endeavor. So thank you so much. Thank and I'm you happy very to much. Questions. <laughs> Yeah, and for, unfortunately, we, we are out of time for questions, but that was so interesting. So thank you very much. All right. For our next presentation, Rowan Gilman from the Louisiana State University Department of Mathematics, Global Linearization of Nonlinear Differential Equations. So welcome. We're happy to have you. Hey, guys. So I'm Rowan Gilman. I'm a rising senior at LSU studying math and computer science. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about a process um, called global linearization. So to give a little bit of context, um, this is a, a process that can be used and applied to a, a bunch of different problems. Um, and we can study it uh, very generally, but to give it a little bit of context, um, first I'm going to kind of introduce you guys a case study for this presentation um, that will hopefully give a little bit of grounding to the problem and uh, allow you guys to understand it a little bit better. So. Uh, in order to introduce this problem, we're going to talk about the Van der Poel equation. So the Van der Poel equation is a second order nonlinear differential equation that comes up in many different fields of science, um, including physics, um, electrical engineering, biology. Um, one key kind of uh, place that it comes up is in the action potentials of neurons. Um, and the actual equation isn't super important, uh, but what we're going to basically try to do is approximate our solution, which is gamma of t. Um, and to, the way we're going to do that is by first representing it as a flow. Uh, and a flow is just a more general way of representing the solution. So at the bottom there, there's gamma. Oh, I have a laser pointer. Gamma, and then t is our time elapsed, uh, and s and x bar are initial conditions. So. For this presentation, I'm going to show you guys how we can get gamma um, from this complicated equation um, that is normally very difficult to do with traditional methods. So to give a little bit of history of the method itself, uh, John Van Neumann and Bernard Koopman 
uh, generated this method to talk about um, something called a determin deterministic dynamical system, which a nonlinear differential equation is an exam uh, example of. And the way that we kind of approach this is instead of focusing on the actual solution of the problem, we'll, we'll just focus on the observables. So to kind of give an analogy, this would be instead of if you have like, for example, a, a, a cube that's filled with gas, um, the actual positions and velocities of those gas molecules is not actually what you're looking for. What you want to know is the temperature or the pressure. And so those are the observables that we kind of want to um, work with. And if you shift your focus from the solution to the observables, um, you can make a lot of progress in actually uh, solving these types of equations. Um, so in, in this uh, presentation, uh, G is going to be our observable that we're looking for. So we have a little bit of math here, but I promise it's not anything too crazy. So uh, <laughs> to describe the dynamics and how this observable changes as we evolve our differential equation, as we move it forward in time, uh, we're going to use this operator T. So all T is doing is we're taking our observable, which starts at some initial time, and moving it forward by some time T. So this is the kind of process of a differential equation. Um, and if we plug in zero into this, uh, nothing happens. So our observable starts at S and X bar, and we end at the same place. Um, and if we move forward by time T and then by time R, uh, it's as if we moved by T and R together. So those are the same. And um, it may not be immediately obvious, but those are also the same properties as exponents. So if you raise something to the power of zero, nothing changes, or you get one. Um, and if you raise something to a power and multiply it by another thing raised to the same to a different power, you can just add the exponents together. And so it makes sense to represent this as a linear operator um, with a generator A. So again, not super important. The details aren't important. But the key is, since we can express this evolution operator as this linear semigroup, um, we can use linear methods to attack a nonlinear problem. So uh, the other thing is specifically for differential equations, um, we can take the, when we take the derivative of this, uh, of this operator, we can break it into a time component and a space component. So um, in a differential equation, you have your solution and you have your time, and those two things evolve simultaneously. Um, and if we can split those apart, it allows us to, uh, Instead of trying to tackle both of them at the same time, we can solve them independently and then bring those two things together. And the way we actually do that is with this thing called the Lee Trotter product formula. And basically, I'll just focus on this part right here. Um, it says that if you have this exponent, which is two different things, so in this case, time and space added together, um, if we just switch back and forth between them, it allows us to um, approximate the actual solution. So the more, the greater your value of n is, the more times you switch back and forth, the better your approximation will be. Uh, and that's uh, what I'll show in the next couple slides, is the actual approximations of this Vanderpool oscillator um, that we talked about at the beginning. So with n equals 1, the blue solution is the actual solution, and then green, orange, and red are different approximations. Um, using different uh, product formulas. And then you can see as we increase our n value, the approximations get a lot better very, very quickly. Um, and overall, the reason why this is useful, for differential equations, I would say it's not particularly useful because there are other methods that converge faster. Where this is important is that it can be used outside of differential equations. So we can also use attack partial differential equations or integral equations. And even larger systems outside of mathematics can be approached using the same method. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, LSU as well as the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation um, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. One question over here. So you're using a um, representative like equation architecture to show how this process works. Is it generalizable to other equation architectures or is it specific for this format? So I've only worked on it with differential equations because this was kind of our testing situation. But 
in theory, yes, it is applicable to other situations. So we want to, in the future, kind of work with partial differential equations and start working on it with that. Um, the details and how we find those approximations, those actual graphs would change, but the overall method of using those observables would stay the same. All right, that's what we have time for. Thank you so very much. All right, next we would like to welcome John Haviland. Um, from Williams College, math in base Fibonacci, recurrences and complete sequences. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm actually from the University of Michigan, but my Sorry. research was conducted at Williams College. So. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk about math in base Fibonacci, uh, which means talking about recurrent sequences and complete sequences. So we'll figure out what this means. Um, so first, we're going to motivate and define our problems. We'll talk about what we know and what can be done in the future. Okay, so our main object of study is sequences of positive integers. So positive integers are just the numbers one, two, three, four, all of these great numbers that we know really well. So if we look at sequences of these numbers, we say a sequence of them is complete if you can write every positive integer as a sum of the terms of the sequence. So to take some examples, um, the powers of two form a complete sequence. To see this, you can take the binary expansion of any number and see that actually the binary expansion is telling you which powers of two to add together to get that number. So this means that using powers of two, we can, we can add powers of two to get any number. So the powers of two are a complete sequence. On the other hand, the powers of three are not a complete sequence because for example, you can't write three as a sum of powers of three, or sorry, you can't write two as a sum of powers of three. Certainly you can write three. Um, the, the powers of three are like one and then three, and already we've missed out on two and everything else is just too big to be helpful. Okay, so uh, a really helpful or a really important motivating example for us is the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci numbers are obtained by, so to get, to get a Fibonacci number, you add together the previous two Fibonacci numbers. And this recurrence, you can, using this recurrence, you can build the, the rest of the entire sequence. And a theorem of Zeckendorf implies that, the, second, or that the, the Fibonacci sequence is a complete sequence. It's actually stronger than this, but in particular, it means that the Fibonacci numbers are a complete sequence. So this is important because it tells us that we can use the Fibonacci numbers to represent integers in the same way that we use powers of two to write in base two, we can write numbers in base Fibonacci this way. Okay, so to generalize the Fibonacci numbers, we look at positive linear recurrent sequences or PLRS. Um, so these are similar recurrent sequences to the Fibonacci numbers, and instead of just adding the previous two terms, we're going to take a weighted sum of some of the previous terms with these coefficients, the CIs here, right? And so, so to get a term of this sequence, we add together a bunch of previous terms of the sequence with, with some weights on them. Um, and it turns out that all of the structure of the sequence is completely determined by these recurrence coefficients. So to refer to a PLRS, we just list out the recurrence coefficients here. And of course, uh, the Fibonacci numbers are a PLRS, and so the PLRSs are a generalization of the Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so the question we're interested in is which PLRS are also complete sequences? And for some families of PLRS, we have complete characterizations. And this means that if you give me a PLRS in one of these families, I can immediately tell you, yes, this is complete, or no, it isn't complete. So for example, if all of the recurrence coefficients are positive, then I can just very quickly tell you whether or not the sequence is complete. Similarly, if the recurrence coefficients look something like this, where we've got a bunch of ones and then a bunch of zeros and then just some number there, I can quickly tell you whether or not that sequence is complete. Uh, we also looked at some um, ways that you can modify complete and incomplete sequences that will preserve completeness or incompleteness. So for example, if you start with a complete sequence, and you decrease the last coefficient there, um, that means that the sequence is going to be growing more slowly, and so you have more to work with to build each integer, and so you're still going to get a complete sequence that way. Um, on the other hand, if you start with an incomplete sequence and you add another term to this recurrence, well, the sequence is going to be growing more quickly, and so if you were already missing some things when you started, you're still going to be missing some things when you make the sequence grow more quickly. So, so these are ways that we can build new complete and incomplete sequences. Lastly, we looked at analytic criteria for completeness and incompleteness because we can associate to each recurrence sequence a characteristic polynomial and then look at the roots of this polynomial. And the roots of the polynomial tell us how fast the sequence is growing. So we showed that there exist bounds such that if 
uh, we can put the roots into these bounds, then we can tell whether or not the sequence is complete. And we also showed that if the, if the roots don't fall into these nice bounds, then the behavior is extremely chaotic and there's no information that we can get there. So some things that we can look at in the future are characterizing more families of sequences in the same way that we did before. This basically involves like brute force combinatorial work using induction and uh, just kind of really writing out all of the steps and, and using certain combinatorial methods. Another thing we'd like to have is a finite time checking algorithm. So this means that you'd be able to give a computer a bunch of coefficients and it will be able to tell you in a bounded amount of time whether or not the sequence is complete. This would be very useful for, for a lot of reasons. Um, so we had some conjectured bounds for these. I, I mentioned these analytic bounds on the roots of the characteristic polynomial. We have conjectured, uh, we have conjectured values for these bounds but we haven't proved that they're correct. They're only based on numerical data and some thinking about best and worst case scenarios. So it would be great to prove that these are correct because it gives a very fast way to check for completeness. And lastly, it would be interesting to investigate other, uh, other relationships in the coefficients. For example, if the sum of all the coefficients is really large, then maybe the sequence has to grow really fast, and so you have to miss some things. So there's a lot of interesting structure that we could investigate here in the future. So yeah, that's all I have. These are some relevant publications. And uh, I'd like to give a huge thank you to the small REU at Williams College and our research mentor, uh, Stephen J. Miller. Um, and also a thank you to the NSF, Williams, Yale, and the University of Rochester for support for this research. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to answer any questions. We have time for a question, this right here in front. That's a really cool problem. Could you just how you figured out whether or not there was chaotic behavior? Yeah, so um, to say that result a little more specifically, um, the, the way this works is if the roots are too large, then, um, then the sequence has to be incomplete. If they're small enough, then the sequence has to be complete. And between this, uh, the roots of complete sequences and incomplete sequences are both dense in the interval between these two bounds. Um, so like no matter how much you restrict your focus, you're always going to find roots of both complete and incomplete sequences. So there's nothing you can gain from information about the roots in that interval. We have time for one more super quick question. Anybody? All right, well, thank you so very much. Very interesting. Thank you so much. All right, next we'd like to welcome Sovies from the University of Minnesota. Yay. Effective magnetite nanoparticle concentration on magnetic remanence. Remanence. Remen yep, that, that too. Yeah, In ferrofluid. Very a good. Big words. A lot of big words. So, You'd think I had a college education. There you go. <laughs> there are a lot of green buttons on this. Okay, so I guess I'm... Big one, big green. Big green. Big green. Okay, so I'm following up a lot of math presentations. Don't worry, I have a lot of pictures. It's okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Savi Zalai. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Minnesota. And today I would like to tell you about magnetic remanence in a ferrofluid. For those of you who are unfamiliar, a ferrofluid is a magnetic liquid. The one I'm using is made with magnetite nanoparticles, like the ones shown here, that are all dispersed in an oil. Our goal is to adjust the concentration of these particles in order to see how it affects a property called magnetic remanence and its agreement with the Wolfarth model. Don't worry, I'll explain what that means. Mm -hmm. um, by doing this, we can indirectly see how particle concentration controls the interactions in our ferrofluid. But let's start by talking about what we're measuring directly. So here's a plot with magnetic moment on the y-axis and applied magnetic field on the x-axis. In the background, you'll see a full hysteresis loop, which I'm hoping you remember from your ENM courses, which gives us some context. First, we'll focus on this blue path. Starting with a demagnetized system, we can apply and then remove a magnetic field H prime, and our system will no longer be demagnetized. The y-intercept of this blue path gives us the magnetization remnants, denoted by IR, for the field H prime. If we apply a strong enough field, we can fully magnetize the system, and saturate the remnants. From here, we can look at the red path, 
Now we apply the same magnetic field, H prime, in the negative direction. And when we remove this field, we'll see the magnetic moment has decreased. And the y-intercept of the red path gives us the demagnetization remnants, denoted by ID, for the field H prime. And in practice, we measure the remnants for multiple fields. And there's a theoretical relation given by the Wolf-Arth model that relates these two quantities for non-interacting systems. Before we make our measurements, the system needs to be demagnetized. In our case, the ferrofluid was made of many magnetite particles, and every particle had its own magnetic dipole that liked to point along one axis. The ferrofluid was demagnetized when every dipole pointing in one direction was canceled out by another dipole pointing in the opposite direction. One way to do this is thermal demagnetization, where we just randomly orient all the dipoles in the system. This is usually difficult, and most ferromagnets need to be at hundreds of degrees Celsius to do this. But in our case, the ferrofluid was thermally demagnetized at room temperature because the particles were free to rotate and move around randomly within the oil. This is very convenient, but it also means we need to freeze the particles in place during measurement, since otherwise the ferrofluid demagnetizes every time we remove a magnetic field and our remnants is always zero. And we did this by keeping it at 77 Kelvin or negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just a normal winter day in Minnesota. <laughs> and the wolf arth relation for a thermally demagnetized system is aligned with the slope of negative two. This means that the same magnetic field will demagnetize your system twice as much as it magnetizes it. To understand why, we can consider the starting point for each case. This box in the bottom left shows a thermally demagnetized system of four dipoles, shown as the arrows. And these dipoles only like to point along one axis, shown as the dashed lines. If we apply a magnetic field strong enough to flip all of these dipoles in the upwards direction, we only flip the two red ones, because obviously the blue ones are already pointing up. This gives us the saturated system shown on the right. But if we apply that same field to the saturated system in the downwards direction, we will flip all four of them, which is two times as much as two. The wolf arth relation is visualized using a Henkel plot, where we plot the remnants parametrically in field magnitude, and we normalize the maximum remnants to equal one. The wolf arth relation is shown here as this dashed red line, but real life is not always so simple. Magnetic systems often have interactions, where neighboring dipoles influence the direction another dipole wants to point. If you have ferromagnetic interactions, neighboring dipoles like to point the same way, making it easier to magnetize and harder to demagnetize your system, which pulls this curve up and to the right. If you have anti-ferromagnetic interactions, neighboring dipoles like to point opposite of each other, making it harder to magnetize and easier to demagnetize, which pulls the curve down and to the left. The stronger these interactions are, the further away this curve will be from the wolf arth relation, which makes this model a good tool for characterizing magnetic interactions, and we'll use it on our ferrofluid. So now we can look at the data. I measured multiple ferrofluid samples, but here I'm just going to show you the ones with the highest and lowest magnetite volume fraction. The volume fraction tells us what percent of the total volume is made of magnetite. So a higher percentage is a higher concentration of particles. For the highest concentrated ferrofluid on the left, our data does not agree with the wolf arth model and instead shows anti-ferromagnetic interactions. However, the least concentrated ferrofluid on the right agrees with the wolf arth model. This tells us that the particle concentration directly affects the strength of interactions in the system. When we decrease the concentration, we allow the particles to spread out, which makes the magnetic interactions weaker, even to the point where we can no longer measure them, as shown on the right. So we've actually created a non-interacting magnetic system, which I'll quickly point out, not to brag, is actually a difficult task on its own. <laughs> and when we compare the Henkel plots of all of our samples with the different concentrations of particles, we can see how particle concentration controls the interactions and thus the remnants of the ferrofluid. I wish I had the time to talk about our model that explains these interactions, but we're currently writing it up for publication. So if anyone wants some good reading before they go to bed, it's a good <laughs> paper to read. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. There's a question from your fellow U of M person. Uh -oh. I know. Uh oh, is right. Uh, what are you gonna say? Uh, so you mentioned that you kept your ferrofluid at 77 Kelvin. How did you cool it? That is a good question. I just put it outside in the winter. No, I'm kidding. I have an extra slide for you here. So this 
is the instrument I used to measure uh, the magnetic moment of my samples. There's a little rod coming down from the top. My sample went right in here. Normally, we'd use a cryostat or a doer, which keeps things really cold. It's a really good thermos. However, I don't have the patience to work with that. <laughs> so I took a funnel, uh, and I plugged the end of it with a wooden cork, and I just put nitrogen in it. And so the sample was just sitting inside of a nitrogen funnel. And I had to refill it every 10 minutes, and I didn't spill that much, so I still have all my fingers. That's awesome. We have time for one more question. Let's go there. Oh, he's going to ask me a hard question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hi, so I mostly work with solid state and magnets, and I was wondering for ferrofluids, you show those hysteresis loops um, in your previous slides. Um, do you still get like shaping crystalline anisotropy that occurs in your ferrofluids? Or is there no such thing as easy and hard axis? Oh, oh yeah, so um, the particles themselves, they're all uniaxial anisotropy. Um, it's magnetite that's usually crystalline anisotropy, but in our case, you know, it's so cold and um, they're kind of elongated particles, so they're shape and isotropy. So this kind of translates to the ferrofluid as a whole, having a uniaxial anisotropy, and that's actually something I skipped over. Uh, the Wolfarth model needs uniaxial anisotropy. So if it had crystalline anisotropy, it'd be a whole mess. And okay. so, so it's not randomized by the, the particles not being aligned? Um, well, it worked, right? Or, OK, OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Please do not let the cold discourage you from coming to visit Minnesota. All right, we want to welcome Orion. What a great name. Uh, well, you're too kind. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Orion. I'm a physics and math double major at UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm going to talk about the X-17 particle today. It's has anyone actually heard of the X-17 particle? Like, not for me. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you're gonna learn about it today. It made a big splash in particle physics news, you know, a few years ago. Um, and, and today, I think my presentation is gonna take on a little bit of a different flavor. I'm gonna be like the critic here, the devil's advocate. Um, I don't really think it exists. Um, and I'm gonna critically analyze it this way. And, and, you know, as an aside, it was kind of began as a fun side project between my PI and I, who I've worked with for a few years, and now we both come to the same sentiment, and uh, we decided to finally do something about it. So, uh, is there, is this the... that is the clicker, the big green button. Okay, so what am I talking about? What's the X17 saga? Um, well, it, it began very innocently in a lab in Hungary. Um, there are some researchers at the Tomki, which is the Hungarian Institute for Nuclear Research. Um, they were looking at the specific, like, nuclear decays of specific elements, and they basically saw that in the electron-positron pairs that were produced, um, there were some strange anomalous results. It didn't really match with the distribution they expected. So in particle physics, there's like this very rosy and poetic picture of, and actually it's very gorgeous, like particles coming into and out of existence. Um, a lot of times they incur pairs. So in this case, it was between electrons and positrons, which they observed. And they wanted to explain this anomaly. And after some calculations, they said, well, the best theory that they had was there was a new particle that was never seen before. And they called that X17. 17 MeV is the mass of it. Um, it would be a beyond standard model particle, which basically means it's beyond our standard model of particle physics, which we hold dear for now. Um, and anything beyond it, if true, would be pretty revolutionary. Um, incidentally, they actually had similar results for a different atom a few years later. Um, that's not going to be the focus of this work. And frankly, it's having a hard time in peer review. Um, but the image that I want to put here is kind of the idea, right? You, you send a proton, you collide it with a atomic nucleus. It gets into an excited but unstable state. And as it decays, there's a lot of residual particles. And these resi residual particles are able to be detected by the detectors. And uh, the Hungarians basically claim that the X in that picture there is the intermediate X17 particle, which then decayed to the electrons and positrons they observed. And this actually didn't gain very much attention un until a few very zealous theorists came by and said, well, um, this could be a fifth force carrying particle. And the fifth force is basically an amalgamation of you know, a bunch of buzzwords like dark matter, dark energy, you know, things that particle physicists have been hounding for a long time. And then the floodgates opened. 
Right? If you go to Google now, you're going to get like hundreds of thousands of search results on this X17 particle. Whether you're from the left or you're from the right, they agree on something. Um, <clears throat> you know, this, is, this seems like it might be a pretty big deal. And if you were the Hungarians, you know, you, would, you like a lot of citations like, like anyone else. But, you know, the theme I want to present today is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And my PI and I basically think they don't really have extraordinary evidence. So there's a lot of like effects that could account for the signal, um, some experimental, some theoretical. We're mainly going to be focusing on two and four, and we're starting with four, which is the electron-positron detector asymmetry. Um, this is basically saying, you know, I have a detector. Does it detect electrons and positrons in the same way? In an ideal detector, you want that to happen, um, but we don't think this happens. And we also think that, you know, this asymmetry actually allows higher order terms, which the Hungarians didn't consider, in the quantum electrodynamic calculations um, as part of their prediction, um, these higher order terms could account for the fake signal that they see. How did we all do this? We simulated it. We took their design. It was basically five special plastic scintillator blocks. Um, and then we shot a bunch of particles through it. We had a charge flip simulation, which basically means, you know, I'm going to shoot. Well, the illustrations down here kind of give you the idea. There's like, you know, if I have red electrons, I want to correlate that with uh, blue positrons in the other four detectors, and then I want to flip the charge. I'm going to have positrons in one detector. I want to correlate it with electrons in the other four detectors. And in this way, you can kind of see, well, does the detector discriminate between these two different scenarios when I do a charge flip? And charge flip symmetry is very important to the theory that the Hungarians have been using to make their predictions. Um, and, and kind of the calculation of interest here is called the detector efficiency. It's basically really roughly like the number of things you detect in your detector versus the number of stuff that you know you sent into it. And these are, I guess, five kind of cryptic plots, but um, very roughly, each of them correspond to, I guess, focusing on one of the five detectors. Um, and it's, it's a plot of efficiency as a function of opening angle, um, like the angle between you know, your electron-positron pair. And the red and the blue correspond to the two charge flip scenarios. Now, in an ideal detector, which is what the Hungarians assumed, you expect perfect overlap. Um, there are some spots that don't really look like they follow that pattern, and, and we can see this more clearly when you take the ratio of one over the other, where you expect a flat line of one, and, you know, there's a lot of peaks and troughs and, and, and interesting discrepancies. So, basically, we found that there's, like, some fundamental level at which the detectors aren't really detecting your electrons and positrons in the same way, and that's a big problem, like, for them, not, not for me. <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, we want to save the standard model. We like the standard model. Um, and, and kind of the theoretical basis that we're going off of is that there's this very important term on the right-hand side that's known as the efficiency-weighted triple product of momenta. Um, it's an important term in higher-order contributions, essentially. Um, and, I mean, in particular, it's radiated corrections to the beryllium decay. Um, normally, these terms cancel out. Like, in a perfect, you know, detector, you have perfect symmetry. Um, these higher-order terms actually cancel out. But if you have asymmetry, um, they do not. And in this plot here with this particular normalization, you know, the canceling out is the orange line, which is zero. Um, clearly, we don't really see a lot of that. We see a lot of deviation. Um, and so these non-zero values indicate that the asymmetry is responsible for a lot of these higher order terms not canceling out. And, and for anyone curious, they're actually called box diagrams. And, you, you know, if you know Feynman diagrams, that's what they look like. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we kind of saw evidence that there was electron-positron asymmetry in the detectors. It strengthens the argument that higher order effects are probably responsible for the X17 signal, because from the previous plot, you can actually extract out fake signals. Um, and we want to do more quantitative analysis. We, I want to tell you exactly how much the discrepancy is. And I also want to kind of compound this with other effects that we think have been kind of sketchy that they did. <laughs> and if I were to suggest a moral here, it would just be, you know, we saw evidence that the standard model is supported yet again. Um, be critical. You know, like the, the theorists that first came out, they just wanted to make up stuff so uh, to match the observations, and it sounded really cool. I mean, it's nice saying, you know, I have a theory that explains a lot of this, and it's revolutionary. Um, but we also need to be critical and be skeptical, and that's, that's a huge part of science as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I give acknowledgments to my PI, of course, Professor Yuri Kolomensky, and my good friend who worked with me, Ben Ormond, and funding by Berkeley and ASF and everyone. Funding is great, makes me happy, makes me smile. <laughs>
Thank you. And unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions, but that was really interesting. The X-17. I love it. Thank you very much. And last but not least, of course, we have Kave talking to us about, just a second. Get rid of these. Hang on. Let's give him a hand for being the last. <laughs> Not an easy position to be in. So, Kave, welcome. Thank you. The mic. Yep, and there's big, big green, green button. button. Big green button. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Kave, as you can see on the slide. Uh, and over the past few months, uh, together with uh, Professor Falson's group at Caltech, We've been working on a very interesting new project and developing a new material system to study some fundamental physics. This material system is germanium telluride in its alpha phase, and we've been growing it in thin film form using a technique known as molecular beam epitaxy. So I'd like to begin by justifying why we care about thin films in the first place and why they're an interesting topic of research. And this is, so to provide some background in experimental condensed matter physics, many projects try to understand or discover new quantum effects um, in solids. And similar to the previous uh, presentation, we're working in with quantum effects on the energy scale of MeV, except this time it's a small m, not a big M. So we're six orders of magnitude off. And what that means is that any defects or interruptions in the crystal structure of your lattice will really wash out these very low energy phenomena. Um, additionally, you, you also have another problem that you just need to be able to create a crystal with the right physical properties to uh, induce these quantum effects. Both of these are challenging, but thin films provide an uh, elegant solution to both. Uh, so when you have a thin film, by, by here I really mean thin, thin film, so a few atomic monolayers, uh, stacking films on top of each other lets you control their interactions. And by doing that, you can actually induce specific quantum effects, like electronic or magnetic materials can provide electronic or magnetic fields. Uh, and the other advantage is that these growth techniques can be extremely precise. We can deposit individual monolayers, and what that means is that we can build very clean, defect-free lattices. Just to provide a very simple, brief example, you can ask me about this later if you're interested. If you stack magnesium zinc oxide, a very thin layer again, on top of zinc oxide, at the interface will actually exist an energy minimum of the electrons. Uh, it's a very neat header structure, and what that means is you have electrons confined to a two-dimensional plane uh, without much impulse to move in the z-direction. And this is a very cool system, uh, and those who have taken an introductory statistical mechanics class would have seen this 2D electron gas before. So germanium telluride itself is a very interesting material system. Uh, it actually spontaneously polarizes, uh, and this leads to a whole host of jargony effects that are really popular if you go to any condensed matter uh, conference. You break inversion symmetry, um, your electron bands stop being degenerate, so your two spin states split in energy. You induce very strong Roche by coupling, uh, lots of fun buzzwords. But sort of the take home message here is that you need a very pure and clean material. Um, and we do this through a growth technique known as molecular beam epitaxy. It, it's something that's pretty intuitive. Essentially, you take a substrate or template material, and then you spray um, gas phase elements of whatever you'd like to grow. The, the energetics work out such that they rearrange and hopefully form the desired crystal phase on your substrate. Um, of course, this, this has the assumption that there's no scattering off of gas particles between the sources in your substrates. You need very low pressures, uh, about 10 to the minus 13 atmospheres. This is extremely small and requires a lot of technical complexity. So here's just a picture of the MBE we grew these in, a lot of fancy, expensive pumps. The whole assembly is about $2 million. So germanium telluride in its alpha phase has been grown previously in thin film form. Uh, except that it's grown on silicon, which is a very common and widespread substrate that's available in high quality. The downside of this is that uh, you use the substrate as a template material, and silicon is actually a little bit different in terms of the interatomic spacing than germanium telluride. And what this means is that the germanium telluride lattice has to stretch and deform to fit on the silicon. It doesn't like this very much. It's a high energy state. So as you grow more and more layers, uh, the lattice tries to relax back to its low energy crystalline state. And this induces defects. And actually, these very pretty wave-like patterns. You can see them in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and this, of course, prevents observation of these quantum effects. Uh, in our research, we've taken the baby steps towards using a new material system here. 
or growing germanium telluride on indium phosphide. This is a slightly more exotic substrate, and it's a little bit harder to work with, but it's a very good lattice match. See that graphically. There's a figure in the lower left-hand corner, and you can see that the atoms for germanium, uh, germanium telluride lattice and indium phosphide just line up very well. Quantitatively, it's 16 times better. So we've spent the past few months optimizing this growth process. And any sort, any sort of optimization requires some feedback steps, some sensing. We've done this characterization primarily using X-ray diffraction. It's a common tool, but if you haven't been introduced to it, uh, you essentially scatter X-rays off of multiple layers in a lattice, uh, provided high periodicity. These interfere conspectively at certain angles that correspond to the lattice constant. Uh, and you end up with a series of peaks. And generally, the widths of these peaks corresponds to the variance in the periodicity in your lattice. And this is a good heuristic for lattice quality. We've achieved a lattice quality of um, about, uh, of about 0 0.2 to 0.4 degrees full width at half maximum. And this is actually three times better than literature figures for films grown on silicon. Uh, X-ray diffraction isn't a very good tool for analyzing the surface quality because it interacts between multiple layers. Um, so we use a technique known as atomic force microscopy. It's actually pretty cool. You take a microscopic probe tip and scan it over your surface. Uh, and this provides a height map of the surface. Literature results show these triangular domains forming. Again, these are for silicon growths. We're seeing the same thing in RFM images, although with larger crystal sizes or larger grain sizes uh, and a slightly flatter overall film. And again, this is very encouraging to show that we're growing things in the right phase and with about the right surface energetics. Uh, so moving forward, um, this is a very interesting material system to study fundamentally, but to improve the growth quality, we'd like to, of course, continue our optimization process while branching into electrical transport measurements, which will give very fundamental information about grain boundaries, electron and hole mobilities, and charge densities. Anyway, uh, that's it. Any questions? Thank you. We have about a minute and a half for your questions. Who's got a question? There's a question right over here. Hi, thanks, great presentation. Um, so when you're under UHV, can you just explain how you monitor the thickness of your thin films? Of course. Uh, we use a technique called read or reflection uh, high energy electron diffraction. Uh, you, it's very similar to XRD, it's a diffraction-based technique. You bounce electrons off of your substrate uh, with your some film thickness on it, uh, and then you look at the resulting diffraction pattern. And as your lattice spacing changes between the film and the uh, substrate, as your film gets higher and higher quality, um, you see peaks similar to this XRD image uh, that gradually get cleaner and cleaner. And this is a good way to monitor growth. All right. And one more question. All right. Can you talk a little bit about the process conditions you're using? What temperatures? What's your growth rate? Sure, sure. So this is, to clarify, this is very dependent on our MBE system. I don't know how generalizable it is. But in general, we're growing germanium telluride with a substrate temperature of about 200 degrees Celsius. Uh, one of the problems with indium phosphide uh, is that it starts evaporating phosphorus and it destroys the surface quality, which is one of the reasons why silicon is so popular as a substrate. Uh, we were using fluxes of about 10 to the minus 8 tor of both of our materials instant on the substrate, so about two orders of magnitude higher than the background. It's a slow growth. All right. 